Hi, everybody. Welcome to our channel, our Scientology Stories Peeling the Onion. My name is Mark Fisher, and I'm here with my guest, Mitch Brisker. How are you doing, Mitch? Hey, I'm great, Mark. It's so great to see you again. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and I wanted to mention to everybody that we are streaming this live on my channel, our Scientology Stories Peeling the Onion, but also on Mitch Brisker's channel as well. So uh, if you have two windows, you know, stream it on both. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. That we could both good. use the views and we could both use the subscribers and all that sort of thing. Anyway, I wanted to mention, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to start immediately because we're waiting for people to get in here into the chat and everything. But if you have a question in the chat, please write the word question. We are going to answer questions. We're also going to put your comments up as well. And I'm going to be interviewing Mitch about his book. And uh, we're, we're going to talk about that. I have different uh, questions I have for him on that. And then if you've got any questions, like I said, please ask in the comments section and we'll put it in there. Please be respectful, you know, just like anybody. You want to be respectful. And, uh, you know, we're, we're excited. I'm excited to talk to Mitch because I, I read his book and uh, it's, I've been meaning to interview him about it because it's really, really, really a good read. Um, Thank you, Mark. Anyway, yeah. And then if, if you want to super chat, you know, super sticker, of course, we'll take that as well. And uh, no problem with that. So with yeah. that, I wanted to welcome, let's start welcoming some people in here. Uh, we've got quite a few people in here, regular viewers. We want to say thank you for viewing. Uh, and we appreciate you all being in here. And I want to show, this is uh, Mitch's book here, uh, Scientology, The Big Lie, How I Made an Evil Cult Look Good by Mitch Brisker. And you, this book is available on Amazon.com. It's also available, Mitch, I think, on your website. Is that right? It is, and at Barnes & Noble, and at uh, Google Books and Apple Books. So, And, and if you and, want an autographed copy, too, you can go to Mitch's merch store yeah. on his channel as well as on his website, and you can get an autographed copy of the book, and uh, you know it's doing very well. But if you want to order it, like I said, you should. I bought two copies of it, actually. I bought oh, the thanks, Kindle Mark. version first. I bought the Kindle version because oh, that right. came out first, right. and I so and then I and then I ordered the the paperback, like, which I have actually right here. I'll pull this down here. Right. Well, would you would you order a when you order a Kindle? <laughs> thanks, Mark. When you order a Kindle or an audio book, and then you, you you order the a hard copy, whether hardback or paperback, we we call that the trophy version, the trophy copy. That's the one you put <laughs> on your shelf. So thank you very much. Well, and that's why I did it too, actually, because I wanted to have a hard copy. Because I the do the. That, you can't do, you can't show it or share it with anybody, you know? Yeah. And, and no, I want to, yeah. I'll comment. There's a few things I wanted to say about it too. Okay. In this as, as long well, as, just to start. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. No, just to start off, I wanted to mention a couple of things, right? Okay. Uh -huh. I read your book and I was, first of all, I, I it's a fantastic book. Uh, be very humble here, Mitch, because I'm going to blow your horn here. Uh, you're a fantastic writer. You know, I, I, I'm not surprised because you're a pro and you're a professional and you were, you know, used to it. But you're you're just a really, really great writer. I mean, not only um, do you tell the stories great, but then you, you also put in like references to like different philosophers or different things in the chapters, which correlate with what you're talking about. And it, it's a just a very instructive read. So I, I really enjoyed that, number one. Number two, it's Thank really well designed. Kind. It's really well designed. I mean, the actual cover artwork, sorry, there we go. Over there. Yeah, there. Cover artwork is great. But what I also love about it is each chapter has like little, little drawings that go with the chapter. Here, I'm pulling one up right now. Like these little, little, little drawings and stuff, and they're really great when you look at them. You know what I mean? So it's well yeah, worth thanks. Get, yeah, thanks. get the yeah. paperback copy. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. Well, I was very lucky. I, I, I was able to uh, uh, engage the talents of an extremely talented book designer who's done a lot of books. Who had been an old friend of mine. That person has chosen to remain anonymous. They are known only as the pseudonym I gave them, which is the Mermaid Cafe. So, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was really lucky. And and like I went through each chapter, I had envisioned that idea with the little icons and then I kind of described each one. And I pulled a lot of visual references for what each one should look like. And then that person interpreted that. And, and it, just so you know, the, it's kind of the main artistic inspiration is a, a, a an American German expressionist wood 
carver, a wood engraver by the name of Lind Ward, who was a, a noted book illustrator. He was maybe the inventor of the graphic novel in that he was known as the, uh, the author without words. And he did very complex novels just in woodcuts. And so if anybody's interested in that kind of stuff, you could Google Lind Ward. Uh, his books are still uh, books of his work is still available. And I was, uh, he was that his work is a big inspiration in how my book looks. Yeah, Leslie Bishop is a is a member of our channel, and she's being sarcastic here. Mitch has a hard time accepting compliments, <laughs> <laughs> but they're well deserved. Well, no, because Thanks, no, Leslie. because I think it was Mark Twain who said I have a I have a tough time accepting compliments because they're never enough. So <laughs> he also said I could live on one good compliment for a month. So Mark, I'm I'm good for like the next six months. Thank you very much. You're too kind. Yeah. No, but but the book is great. It's really well written, like I said. And I know you you were recording. There was a question in here about the audio book. Um, I, you were recording that, but it looks like from your studio that maybe you completed it. What, what's the no? The I'm, <laughs> so it turned out to be a much bigger challenge than I thought. I will be in this studio as long as I'm recording it. So okay, once it's done, I'm tearing this thing down and I'll redo the the streaming studio. Okay, great. So, so yeah, at some but, point then. It will be coming out in audio, and I'll probably listen. Yeah, to Yeah, I was. Well. I have. I have some. I have some media from a, another, a foreign English speaking country. I have a TV show uh, interview, hitting the end of this month. I was hoping to have it ready by then, but I don't. I don't really. It was really difficult. I mean, I've directed hundreds of hours of people speaking narration and books and stuff, but you know, I'm having. I'm recording it myself. I mean, I don't, it's not like I can go out and run a studio. I'm recording it myself. I'm sitting on my shoulder directing it, and I'm the talent. It's really tough. So it's, I finally got it down, and now I'm starting to move forward pretty rapidly. I understand. Well, I mean, not that this not that this is a how to make an audiobook, but I just it's, it's I've spent so much time in this cramped little little space capsule that it's somebody asked me about it, and I'm just happy to talk. So. No, it's great. I mean, that's my preferred way of reading books in these days. Yeah, I'm in the car I, and I listen to them and all that. Man. But so what I did with your book because I started with the Kindle version, but then when I got the paperback version yeah, i just decided you. i'm going to read a chapter a night you know what i mean and then yeah. i got then i got caught and then i was reading like three four chapters at a time and you know what i mean and it just it really picks up for me because you know my background you know of course is i i worked uh, at the gold base i was in scientology uh from 19 well 1973 until 1990 when i left in the last six mm -hmm. years i worked for david miscavige in his right. office and then our our sort of past sort of crossed in the night because you got hired as the professional director right and then it wasn't maybe four or five months later three months later that i was gone for good and then you picked up doing all sorts of professional things that you talk about in the book which we're right. going to go through and i have some questions for you about that sure but, uh, so i i was really fascinated by the later stories because i wasn't around then so i and i could totally place myself in those areas where you were at because i had those same type of experiences just at a <laughs> yeah. time. yeah you know? i mean i i've wondered mark since i've met you and we've become friends i've wondered like uh, my early days at gold when i came up in 1990 and i was very naive and very gung-ho and i was very much dedicated to my my career and to lending part of my career to my religion it turned out that they just hoovered the whole damn thing up but yeah i i, I often i have this picture of David Miscavige and his entourage walking around the coming around the corner near where the garage is up at Gold Motor Pool. Yeah. And thinking, oh, that could have been the day that David was assaulting Mark because I didn't know about any of that. And I just wondered, right. you know, maybe if you just yelled a little louder, I, I might have, <laughs> I might have, you might have saved me 30 years of grief. But <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I, I just have to say one more thing, even though we never met yeah. during the four or so months that we yeah. overlapped. It is a big space. You can be there for 30 years and not meet somebody. Mm -hmm. that's crazy. But you did a lot of things that affected the area that I went into. So I experienced a lot of your 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 thumbprint uh, without knowing who you were. So I right. hope you're going to ask me right. questions about that. Like a lot of the I materials. Do. I we do. Have. I have questions about it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, let me go ahead and get started. I've got questions here. And like I said, if you all have questions, get in the chat and go ahead and put them in here. And, uh, you know, we'll get to them uh, as at the end after I ask the questions with Mitch. But if you have Great. comments, also mention them there as well. And, of course, subscribe to Mitch's channel. Subscribe to our channel. 
And here we go. All right. What I wonder, what I really liked is uh, at the very beginning, of course, you tell your story about, you know, where you grew up and all that sort of thing. And you and I talked on the phone afterwards. Yeah. A bit. Yeah. But one of the things I, I really loved is that I'm a big Hollywood history buff. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a big location in L.A. history buff. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I go to Los Angeles from when I visit from Vegas, I constantly I'll go to, you know, famous film locations or mm -hmm. you know stars houses mm -hmm. so i've been to laurel canyon and you grew mm -hmm. up in laurel canyon i right? did well i didn't just grow up in laurel canyon i grew up in laurel canyon when it became laurel canyon like right. when, it, when it became this legendary mythical uh you know rock and roll uh center uh back in the 60s and 70s i mean but i uh, prior to that it had always had this mystique there was lots of you know tom mix lived up there and Right. And uh, I, you Houdini, know, I wrote, right? yeah, Houdini. Well, yeah, yeah Houdini. I, 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 we grew up playing around the Houdini mansion, and then it burned down, and, and then the Laurel Canyon fire of 1958. And uh, fortunately, I was away at summer camp. I was a little kid. Uh, we used to play in the burnout ruins. And then when I was doing some research for my book, I had to confirm things. It turned out the recent historian said he never lived in that in that house. He only stayed in the guest house. So I'm not sure what the deal with that. I know Jim Morrison also lived in the guest house for a good time that he was in Laurel County, but yeah. And it's, that's it's, why I, I, I got fascinated because I, that's my music scene. I mean, I'm younger than you are a little bit, but not little by bit, much, yeah. but, but you know, the seventies music, early seventies, Oh Johnny yeah. Mitchell, you yeah, know, Jackson, yeah, Jackson Jackson Brown, Nash and Young, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. They're the monkeys yeah, they the, lived up yeah. there in Laurel Canyon. So I, when I finally went several years ago, I was surprised when I drove in there. It, it's almost like you're back in the woods somewhere. I mean, it doesn't remind me of Los Angeles. No, it's Laurel not. It's, it, I think that was part of the real draw. If anybody's watched any of the various uh, 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 films about presentations, documentaries, whatever about Laurel Canyon, one of the great draws is that you could feel like you were in an urban area, uh, like like in a, in a rustic urban area in 10 minutes. You could be at the strip and you could be performing or watching at the yeah. whiskey go go. So it was pretty crazy. It's a crazy place to grow yeah, up. I don't know what my parents were thinking. My mom wanted to move to Brentwood and my dad found this house in Laurel Canyon. And it was woof, it was crazy. I mean, we literally used to hear like the birds rehearsing on Cass Elliott's deck on Sunday afternoon in from my backyard. Cause it was just it yeah. was a really wild place. And and then you went actually lived on a street that I next time I go to LA I'm gonna I'll go by. Your oh yeah, I'll take you there. I'll take you there because you're like on. I've been to the you know the store, the country yeah. store or whatever, and right. then behind it everybody says that's where Jim Morrison lived. Well, no, there but yeah there is. But yeah, if you go further, a, then it's yeah. where you live, right? Down off live. the this road, uh, uh, Honey. What's it called? Honey Drive. Honey Drive. Yeah, Honey Drive. Yeah, that, yeah. And, and then and then you met. What I loved is when I'm reading the book, you talk about. Oh, the only apartment complex was right across from our it was built back in the 20s and 30s, and it was a brothel, you know, yeah, it was it was a brothel, executives yeah. and stuff, right? So I yeah. immediately went to Google Earth and I actually zoomed yeah. in on Honey Drive, yeah. and there's that L-shaped apartment place yeah. that you described because it is prominent in your book in these stories. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Early on, and it's right there. I was like, it's amazing to me, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, there's it's a few right of there. these. There, there's a there's one in Beechwood Canyon that was designed by a a Hollywood production designer. It's very famous. It looks like a, uh, like a gingerbread, like a Hansel and Gretel gingerbread, uh, uh, like a, like a village of little apartments. And these were places, you know, back in those days, the actors were on contracts with the studios. Then uh, eventually that became illegal antitrust and all that, but they would, they would, they would sort of recruit these, uh, these starlets and they would put them up in these apartments. And then sometimes they'd, you know, they'd offer them some little extra work so yeah, the, it was yeah, absolutely. It was a brothel the way it's designed, and and a lot of interesting actors and musicians lived there over the years, and you know, so I met some interesting people there. I mean, not only did I grow up in a really kind of storied place, but I grew up on the street where crazy stuff had happened in the past. So yeah, we were no, Mark. We were yeah. used to it. We were just so used to like seeing. Yeah, it's stuff. It, it, yeah, it was like. Well, you know. and, and I've watched those movies on Laurel Canyon. There's a, yeah. I've seen at least two of them. Uh, there are YouTube, you know, videos shot where people walk down the street and show you the different places. They're really yeah. interesting. I, I saw a movie on, I read a book and saw a movie on the Chateau Marmont, which is not oh, that yeah. far away. Yeah. And the whole Sunset Strip. I mean, it's. I've always been fascinated by that whole area. Yeah, that's where, uh, 
Chateau Marmont. That's where John Belushi passed away, yeah. overdosed. Yeah. Well, and then uh, yeah, my, I have another fascination, which is kind of a guilty pleasure of mine. A friend of mine that? turned me onto this site, and this is a little morbid, but it's a friend of mine turned me onto this site years ago called Find a Grave. And I like well, yeah, looking I know at that one. cemeteries. Yeah. I like looking at cemeteries where famous people are buried, and I go visit them. I've I've been to wow. the Westwood Pierce wow. Brothers one three times over the last. 15, 20 years. And then I finally, last time I was in LA, went to the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, which I've never been to. That's the big one, yeah. That's... Studios. And you, it's amazing, all the famous people that are buried there. And, you know, it's you know, they're not their body. I mean, it's their body's yeah. buried there and all that. But yeah. it's just kind of cool just to walk around and just sort yeah. of reminisce about the different people. Um, well, cemeteries are the... for the living. They're not for the dead, so... Well, and then there's a great YouTube channel called Hollywood Graveyard, where this guy wow. does he does whole videos where he goes through and he does little clips about the person. Like it could be some obscure actor from the 40s or whatever, but they'll talk about him and then they'll show like a little clip or whatever and tell you a little bit about the history. So anybody who's interested in that sort of thing, Hollywood Graveyard, fantastic. It's a oh, fantastic. I'm going to check that out. I, I, next, you remind oh, you know, Mark. Fantastic. Next time you're in LA, I'm going to take you on a tour that'll blow your mind. So, okay. I, I have a lot of stuff I've never seen published. But, well, see, yeah, and then the same thing too was like when I was a kid, when I was ten years old, was the Manson murders, and I was yeah. fascinated by that when I saw the Life magazine cover of Charles Manson, yeah. who I had no idea later. I found out, oh, he'd been involved in Scientology and Dianetics. You know what I mean? But um, but I got fascinated by that too. So I've gone to like Cielo Road or whatever that house is. No Cielo, yeah, I used to hang out there. My best friend's girlfriends lived on that street. And, yeah. and, and and I don't know if you saw. I did a stream about going. to, I went to a party when I was 19, 18 at Dennis Wilson's house. I mean, don't even ask me how I ended up at Dennis Wilson's house, a Beach Boys drummer. Because in those <laughs> days, it was just like you went. You just found open out about, door. You just came. Yeah, right? you found out if you know your invitation was. You knew about the party. If you knew about the party, you knew somebody. So it wasn't a problem. And I walked into a room and confronted Manson and and three of the family members. And I didn't put that in the book, but I did a stream about it. Because I didn't, consider, you know, I didn't know who it was. And then, all oh, two months later, when we saw him in the, when they were arrested, the murders happened. And they were arrested. It was we were like, well, Dad, I used to spend like many weekends, like four houses down from the Cielo Drive uh, residence, because my best friend's girlfriend, like she lived there with her parents, so we used to hang out there in the guest house over the garage, and you know, it's crazy stuff. I mean, that thing had. I, I was the age where. When the Manson murders happened, there you really felt it because if you had long hair and you were looked anything like a drug user or you know whatever counterculture, you were a potential murderer for a good couple of months, and it, it killed everything. I, people cut their hair, they changed the way they dress, they moved out of town. I mean, people don't. It doesn't get enough, the Manson murders don't get enough credit for killing the the era of flower power and the whole hippie movement. I mean, that was it, done. Yeah. So. And I, I'm sure you've seen this movie, but Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I think oh, I've yeah. watched that. Yeah, I, I hated five it. Five or six times. Yeah, five I, or six I, times I've watched it. I hated it for three days. That's a whole, we could do a whole stream on that. I hated <laughs> the film for three days. And then on the fourth day, I went, well, it was called Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It wasn't yeah. a documentary. Because my initial reaction was, those people did not die so that Quentin Tarantino could make a really hip, cool, funny movie. Like it kind no, of, no. Yeah, it's so like I a will, fairy tale, but it was like his other ones, you know, glorious. Yeah, Pastor, not you know really. I mean? Gunning yeah. down, gunning down the Nazis and all that. You know what I mean? In theory, that yeah, but really but, happen, but come on, know? Mark. You know who doesn't want to see Hitler alternate history where Hitler, Hitler. You know, but the Manson people. But like anyway, I it really bugged me. And then when I thought about it, and I thought the way he switched everything up, he did some great things. Pandora's box doesn't exist anymore, but he did put it the club where we used to hang out. The Beach Boys used to be the house band there. But um, he put it on the acting, Boulevard. The, acting's, the acting is amazing, too. Unbelievable. How about, yeah. how, about, how about Musso and Franks? That was great, too. That looked Yeah, that, that was, was great. I, 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 yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I, yeah, I practically grew up eating there. But, uh, yeah, I watched very carefully all the accuracy in the film. And the one mm -hmm. thing that was really inaccurate was where Pandora's box was because he had it on Coenga Boulevard. But the one thing that Tarantino nailed that blew my mind, and like I said, on the fourth day, I fell in love with the film. I had to get over the my, my own weird biases. The 
the one thing he nailed that you will never ever get unless you were a native of LA is when the Brad Pitt character, the stunt man, made the drive from Cielo out to where he lived in a trailer in Sunland, right? On the like that, yeah. it was like this long freeway drive. It was it was not in real time. It was so much like driving from those two places. Like he somehow captured the exact essence and the sort of feeling of what it would be like to drive on the, the 170 or the 405 out to Sunland. It blew my mind. I, how do you do that? And and, and you're, you're you're making a, you're making a film that happened in you know uh, 1979. So right, really, it was. I thought it was a real good great piece of work. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go on to my next question. Okay, okay great. And this is this is a little personal. From it's from that time period, and, I, okay. and you've talked to us already about this on an earlier interview that we did with you. Yeah, and that, was, that was how you, how you got into the it was the late '60s and early '70s. How you got into drugs, right? Yeah. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that because you actually you didn't just you know smoke marijuana. I mean, you went all the way. You were yeah you know, kind of addicted. Yeah, to I was heroin. strung out on you heroin. Talk, yeah, you talk you talk openly about it in your book and also in the interviews in life and all that. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, you know, because obviously you, you eventually got kicked the habit and all that sort of stuff. I did. But have you ever reflected on why you even got involved in that in the first place? In heroin? What, what the cause of that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, very, very rarely. Uh, a little bit when I wrote my book. I mean, here's the thing. Uh, drugs was a, it, we the, the culture that I grew up in uh, as a teenager was so soaked in drugs. It wasn't even funny. Right. There was all of this heroin coming over from Vietnam and, and you know, it was no longer an inner city thing. And, uh, you know, I had whatever it was, whatever some level of anxiety that I had, because, you know, drugs, in my estimation, you only take you only get involved in drugs because you're uh, some kind of trauma informed situation in your life. Like you're disconnected from something. And at that time, I mean, I think I was I was 15 when I first did it. And that that's a really rough time. I mean, you're starting to disconnect from your youth, your childhood. And you're having right. to form a, a future adult thing. And it can be very stressful. I don't know what it was, but heroin was there. <clears throat> and I was kind of, um, oh, you're going to smoke weed? Well, I'm going to do heroin. I, it wasn't that I was com uh, uh, competitive, but I was very open to new experiences and uh, very much of a kind of ideologically counterculture. I, I never considered myself a hippie. I was involved in music and I was involved in art. And, uh, you know, I was 15. I was reading William Burroughs. I even read, believe it or not, the, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, you know, Hubbard's good friend uh, who wrote Diary of a Drug Fiend. I, I can't think of his name right now. Uh, you know, uh, the, the famous um, magic guy who was one of Hubbard's gurus. Uh, come on, somebody in the chat help me out. I'm just going oh, you're talking about Alistair Crowley? Yeah, Alistair, Alistair Crowley. Crowley. Yeah, so I'd read, so yeah, I, I was reading this stuff when I was a kid. Like, I, I really cracked me up when I found out that Hubbard had been informed by Crow Crowley because he was just such a lunatic. But I still have a copy of uh, Diary of a Drug Fiend, uh, Crowley's book, uh, in which he he describes going insane. And <laughs> it's, it's crazy. So I was kind of off. Uh, you know, I was reading Jack Kerouac and I was kind of living on the fringes and heroin just seemed like a natural thing to do. You know, like it seemed a way to, of, of, of identifying yourself away from this crazy world of the assassinations, Martin Luther King, JFK, the Vietnam War. You know, you, you know, it, it, like how you needed to disassociate from you needed to reassociate yourself away from that as something else. Unfortunately, that's the direction I went in. So that. Uh, I understand. It, it, and then, of course, then you told the story to us, and it's also in the book about how you got into Scientology through basically detoxing and getting off uh, heroin. Yeah, well, it was at actually the yeah, Center, at the Celebrity Center, right? Yeah, it was really a bizarre story. It was actually, um, I got it during a brief period where I was not using drugs, which happened a lot. On I was up and down and up and down and up and down. It wasn't like I was just this continuous junkie or something. And I was in a rehab, and they, a producer from a, a CBS, an independent film producer, was working out of CBS Studio Centers, uh, called the rehab. They were looking for young people who had experience as drug addicts, and they were making a quasi, quasi like this director Floyd Mutrix. He he was trying to do like his like cinema verite version of like American Graffiti, like the drug soaked version of it. So my girlfriend right. and I got cast in the lead of the title role, not the lead, because it was an ensemble piece. We got cast and uh the film was did quite well. I mean it was uh 
uh, it was a uh, top number two at the box office for two weeks in the summer of 72, I think, what, 73. I'm trying to remember. I think 73 when it was released. It's still streaming on Amazon if you want to like watch it. And it's in the Museum of Modern Art personal collection. Uh, collection. But anyway, so she very tragically died of, a, of, a, of an overdose because we started using again after we made the film. And uh, the director, I've written about this in detail in my book. I think it's one of the more right. interesting. Absolutely. Of, yeah. It's a lot more interesting than maybe Scientology. But the guy who directed the film, he started dating some girl who was taking uh, courses at Celebrity Center. And he thought it would help me. So he brought me down there. They took me in and, and actually allowed me to live there with them for six weeks, which, you know, Mark, that's not a thing that. No, that's not a thing. Like you today, you would get in trouble. But they, for some reason, really liked me and uh, or something. Because it's not even like it cost my father paid them a couple hundred bucks a week. I mean, there was they weren't making money off of me. It was whatever. But they took me in. And I lived with them for six weeks. I did a bunch of Scientology. And then I went back to college to finish my degree and uh, started a career as a commercial film director. Because that's, in those days, it's the only job I could get. Uh and uh, so, yeah, and then some years later, they approached me about making films for the church, and that's how I got started. Yeah, and I, I actually looked up, you know, you talk about when you went to college in the yeah. Valley, I guess it was, at uh, the arts. It was like an arts. Uh, yeah, California School. through the Arts. It's a really noted. Yeah, and I didn't school. know anything about it. So yeah. when I read that in your book, I immediately yeah. went to Wikipedia to look it up and see where it was located and all that. And I had no idea. It's a very famous school. Yeah, and it's in Valencia, it. California. Yeah, and they, up by and Magic they, Mountain, right? Yeah, they, well, it's yeah. Actually, it, it, the off ramp is McBean Parkway, and then Magic uh -huh. Mountain would be two off ramps later. Okay. Yeah. So a lot when I was in school there, a lot of the media kids like who had skills in camera, especially in sound, they would get summer jobs working at Magic Mountain because they needed tech, technicians to do things. So it's really funny you had a bunch of art students working at Magic Mountain. Well, <laughs> I well, let me ask you this, history. okay? So, sure. so you got in, you got into Scientology, and we don't have to go through your whole history of Scientology, but sure. you know, on the Scientology grade chart, you know, where you go up the levels right. and stuff like that. How far up did you get? You know, in your time yeah. in Scientology, yeah. Like, yeah. did you get up through clear and onto the OT yeah. levels, or yeah, because I can relate. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah, by the time I got to gold, which is nineteen eighty, I just, I got to OT five which although you know it went through some iterations after that and then i had done some training some academy levels uh but you know i never had moved. you done had you had you done any ot levels before you came up to gold yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i was up to ot5 the day oh, I okay so you were audited. you were up to audited knots that's that's the yeah i was up to audited OT, knots right? and yeah. i never mm -hmm. moved another inch once i got to gold because you know even though our old friend greg wilher who you know well who was a big top yeah. lieutenant back then when they were when they were uh, seducing me or whatever you want to call it to keep working there after one film, one of the things they said was, you know, Dave wants you to know because you know it's always Dave wants you to know that uh, if you work here, you won't have to worry about your bridge because it'll all be provided for you. Right. Well, that was what I was going to ask you. I was going to say, did they actually, you know, with part of your compensation, were you a lot, you know, did they get you further up the bridge? Because it's yeah, just absolutely. So public. No, the people watching, it's very expensive. Yeah, very expensive. Person yeah. To pay for uh, on OT5 is where you're actually sitting in session holding the cans, looking for all these BTs and clusters. Yeah, and yeah, it's around. crazy. And, and, and you pay by the hour. You know, yeah, when, it's you're, very expensive. when you're a public person, I did it, of course, as a staff member, and I got all the way through it. I got all the way up to my solo uh, knots, right, right, seven, right, as a staff member. But, but you know, if you had to pay for it, I mean, it's it's hundreds. It's of thousands insane. Of dollars. But, but yeah. also, Mark, I think you were you 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 navigated those waters in a day when it, it, there was more attention on helping the staff. To move oh, yeah. up the bridge. I mean, after yeah. you left, I mean, you you were really fortunate. You left at a time when after that, things just, you know, I came up when things were just starting to go crazy. So, well, no, that's what well, we're going to get to that. Cause I would, like I was saying, I, I always, you know, uh, you know, the whole time I was in the C organization, I fully took advantage of my study time, two and a half hours a day. And, well, and see, also I got, I got yeah. audited too, only because I worked for Miscavige. I had priority, unfortunately. Right, so I was able right. to get through my knots and all that, whereas people lower down, they didn't really get the priority to do that. And also, you know, they were working around the clock. I was working around the clock too on some things, but no, I, I still made sure that I learned, you know, the different things because 
to me, I was a true believer right. and I wanted to make those gains. You know what I mean? Anyway. Well, I, let me, let me guess you did it on weekends mostly, right? No, actually, I, I did oh, it. Okay. I had to be up in the morning to go do it two and a half hours. Even if even if oh. Dave went to bed at two in the morning, I had to be up at eight well, in the morning to go to course because he had the exception, but we didn't. We had to go. Yeah, no, I hear that. I mean, I, the only opportunity I had to do courses was on weekends or time off. And I had a family in L.A., so what was I going to do? I was going to I already yeah. sacrificed them for a job and now I was going to sacrifice them to go up the bridge. So I never did. And then after a time and I, I did get some auditing. I remember Ray Midoff, who was the senior CS international highest technical person in the world. He he did re, he he did repair auditing on me on, on an L. And so I would get some really, you know, occasionally. But, you know, mostly it's just sec checks and. You know, really yeah, well, that's every, trust me, like my last two years in, that's all I got was sex. Yeah. yeah. And then in terms of courses, it wasn't what I wanted to do. Nothing, anything in Scientology is what you want to do because you basically are turning your agency over to this team of people. They're going to tell you what's right. And, and you have been gaslit into believing that they have your best interest at heart, which is just, it amazes me. I mean, uh, but, you know, so I did these courses as they would come out, like, you know, the life orientation well, course. Well, like, like yeah, uh, sure. yeah. what was that other well, one? Gonna... The, the uh, one key to life. The, yeah, key to life. life. Thanks. It's insane. Well, I was going to tell you, I, you just, you just made me realize. Well, you just made me realize I remembered something, which was that before Hubbard died, like if you were going to be promoted to an executive position, you were mm -hmm. put on full time training and, right. and you would get right. through these different things. After Miscavige took over, ah, what was that? They just put you on a position and you had to sink or swim, you know? Yeah. But it was the same thing. <clears throat> we also were guinea pigs, like on key to life. And I never did life orientation, but key to life in 1981, I had right. to do that full time because I was going to be put on position up there with Hubbard. And it was right. a pilot. It was something like we were guinea pigs. Like I was on the first Purif and I'd never done drugs before sweating in a sauna in Clearwater. I did the running program in Griffith Park in 1982 when I was on the RPF. Yeah, I heard you say that's that. That's what I Hubbard was it. working on. <laughs> so like we were the staff were the guinea pigs yeah. for this stuff. You know what I mean? Well, that's always been the case at, <laughs> at the international base. It's, um, yeah. you know, you, you know, and I know this is really inside baseball, but all of these like superpower was originally aimed at the staff because you know hubbard was concerned about their inability to make films and that's uh, what it was for it wasn't yeah, for the right public. yeah right and then you had a uh, false purpose rundown mm -hmm. which was to get at everybody's evil evil you know evil stuff and then what and then else the yeah. truth rundown yeah the truth, truth rundown, rundown to, like yeah. implant you with the total misinformation and yeah i had that i was one of the few public that ever got it so yeah yeah, so, no, yeah, I, I understand really that. Scary. And then, then we didn't even. I don't know if you ever experienced rollback. You know, that was well, another one that they maybe every know, other it, month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so it was crazy times. But uh, yeah. anyway, I wanted to find out, you know, if that was part of your of your deal. Now, let me get on to the next thing. Okay. Um, well, I just let me right. to, just to button that sure, up. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I never moved on the bridge after I went to gold and it was only a few years uh, no more than 10 after i went started working there that i no longer wanted to go up the bridge because there was i was uh half the time i was there i was just franchised and trying to find a soft way out because it was yeah, just I understand. too too insane now let, let me get okay so you got hired and, and i know the story about and you told this with mark headley about you know right. you did the music video for edgar winter i did yeah. was fan, fantastic guy i i had to take care of him and his wife edgar sweet months. sweet people really oh, sweet amazing people yeah. i you know because yeah. they came up to the gold base to work on mission earth and right. some other things right and he's just a fantastic talent yeah. and i just i couldn't read her the one of the best saxophone players you'll ever hear and yeah that he sang but his career was just sort of like frankenstein and yeah. a couple other songs you know yeah. but anyway so you did that video and then you did the Dynasty yeah and you know i just have to say i just yeah. have to say when i was when mark and i were when headley and i were talking mm -hmm. about that thing i was thinking of you because i know you had produced that album i didn't know you but but later I found yeah, out. Road to Freedom, were, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, that, was, that was from Mission Road. Yeah, that, yeah. This is no, that's great. 
But then also, do you, you probably told a story on our channel too. I don't know if you know on the Mission Earth album, they actually got Bruce Widian to uh, come up and produce and engineer the album, who was yeah. Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, it, the, the no, did you hear that story? Really... I'll, I'll tell it in a second. But yeah, you, yeah, he was yeah I did hear there. it. I heard it on your channel. Because he liked the he liked the song Bang Bang. So he, they got him up there to mix and do all this sort of stuff. And because his wife was wearing perfume and Hubbard said, no perfume anywhere in right, my studio. Right. He, his wife got called out on her perfume and they got in the car and they took off and never came back. <laughs> yeah. I used to joke that I remember one day we were shooting a film about toxins getting into your body. And we were making the point that there's a lot of insecticides and so forth and produce and it's because gold is out in an agricultural area. I went and I hired a, a crop duster for, I don't know, they're really cheap. And I told him, just, you know, fill the tank full of water and we're going to miss this field and I'm going to get a nice shot of it. And I was thinking, boy, if I ever wanted to take gold out, I would just go hire that guy and I'd fill that crop duster full of cheap perfume and just fly over the base. Because, you know, for such a resilient group of OTs, man, that was the cheap perfume will send them running, screaming out of a room like nobody's business. Well, and at, shortly after we left in 1990, Janice, Terry and I uh, thought about you know, we should get we should get a helicopter and drop flyers all over the base yeah. over there saying, yeah. like, if you want to leave, we'll be out here with a bus on this date. You know what I mean? And, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah I anyway, uh, so uh, so you got hired as a director yeah. to come up and right. direct one technical film. One. Right? Yeah. And and and, and I'm, I'm going to give a little backstory from my yeah. side of things. OK, because okay? the the gold crew, the cinema, the, the shoot crew, as they call them, right? Mm -hmm. They, you know, they've gone through directors and directors. They were not professional at mm -hmm. all. I mean, they basically were trained by Hubbard and, mm -hmm. and different materials that I had to put together and all that. And they could never get anything really let literally through. Okay. So finally mm -hmm. they, uh, Miscavige goes like, that's it. We're going to hire a professional mm -hmm. director. And that's when you were hired. Yeah, and, uh, you came up and I was going to ask you, what were your first impressions when you got up to the gold base, when you actually saw it for the first time and and uh, got to see the crew and meet everybody? <laughs> yeah, I remember. Well, I wrote in detail about the entire drive to the base. Yeah. About getting there. I mean, my first experience at the base was going up there and meeting some executives at the Star of California, which is their faux clipper ship which is just this most, it's the most surreal image. It's this clipper ship that's moored to a desert. Against a pool. <laughs> yeah, it's moored to the desert. And it, it's it's kind of this great symbol for the ship ain't ever leaving here and either are any of the staff. I mean, they might yeah. as well just put a sign up. But what was my impression? Well, you know, I one of my impressions is kind of funny because gold is it's fashioned after the, it's fashioned after the old Hollywood studio system that was developed by Thomas Ince. Thomas Ince was supposedly murdered by by uh, uh, by Randolph, William Randolph Hearst, and 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 he was good friends with with Tom Ince. And Hearst gave Ince a bunch of money, uh, his his widow uh, some strange cash gift after Ince's death, and that cash was used to purchase the Chateau Elysee, which is today Celebrity Center. So Celebrity right. Center, the building has this weird sort of blood money past that nobody talks about. And so I was reminded of that when I was walking around gold because they, 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 they embody exactly the old studio system, like all of the departments, which Hollywood still does, but in terms of owning their own theaters and owning their own actors and sort of the way they kind of over manage everything, except Hubbard left a few key organizational steps out of the film production uh, theory, which has always caused chaos at gold and can never be changed. Uh, but my impression was it was a lot of people, the ones that were interacting with me, that were bending over backwards to appear stable, well-mannered, and tasteful the way people do it who aren't, the way people who don't have taste aren't well-mannered and aren't tasteful. When they put on a show, there's something very weird about it. Like, it's too much. The food, it's too much the manners it's too much it's like you really feel like you're being set up for something and in spite of that i still came back and you know negotiated a deal and said okay i'll do a film and then you know but that was no, my exactly. impression I, yeah and the other you know well, i wasn't but but when i first came up being hired that was for a meeting but i think you mean what did i what did i 
thing first day um, like on the you job. know like walking around the property when you went in the gym for the first time you know what i mean when the gym is well like, when i went on the gym was, for the first time was i was studio. I, yeah, I they was called appalled. It the gym, but it was a studio. Yeah. Yeah, the small studio. I was appalled because it was all painted white inside. And that was the first thing that told me that nobody here knew how to make films because it, it's a, it's just a law of that a, a film studio is dark because you want to build light into it and you want to control light. So you have to start with no light. Usually photo studios, like photography studios, are high key white. Right. Mm -hmm. If you've ever walked in a photo studio, it's uh, it's common that they're like a high key white. Film studios are always black. They're dark. They're dingy. They might even be literally black. So I walked in there, everything was white. Even the the floor was white epoxy, and I was just like, this is going to be a nightmare to shoot anything in here, because as, so as soon as you turn the light on, it's going to be bouncing everywhere. You're not going to be able to really control it. So that was kind of my first, uh, my my That's my first. Yeah, that was my I first impression. That, yeah, yeah, it was my first impression. I was like, "Oh, well, I I've been spending shooting for years in these yeah. studios. Some of them were new. Some of them dated back to the twenties, and they were all really dark and dingy because nobody ever sees the studio. They were really hung up on what the studio looked like. But the thing that nobody ever sees, because they do tours, they like to impress people. So it's really wrong priorities. Then the other thing is the people were so incredibly polite to me. Everybody called me, sir. Everybody called me, Mr. Brisker. Everybody was like, as they call snap and pop years later, a couple of years ago, I, when I finally reconnected with, with Jackson Moorhead, who I knew very well when he was there and we were talking, he said, Hey, but should you know that I was responsible for your clearances? I was the one, you know, who had to overlook all the security issues having to do with you. And he said, did you know, that the crew was under very strict orders to operate with you a certain way. I'd kind of guessed that a little bit, hearing it from the security chief, that they were literally sat down and briefed. I mean, these guys were being scrutinized within an inch of their life. If one of them, like, it gave me a hard time, you know, and I'm just not that kind of person. Like, I don't expect or demand that or anything. Um, and then uh, another person who, uh, name I'm not going to mention, whatever, she's been out forever. She was my... Uh, video assistant for many, many years. You know her well and her mm -hmm. sister as well. They're twins. Yeah. You know who I'm talking about. And yeah. she uh, she and I started communicating and she sent me a message one day that said, Hamish, do you know that we were told absolutely do not socialize with you in any way. Don't exchange any information, no personal stories, no nothing. And it was crazy. I mean, that all changed after we finished a film and everybody saw how easy it was to get along with. Right. And then all of a sudden the shoe crew, they left, they started leaving them alone because they were now a productive group. And so then, you know, they all wanted to be my best friend. And some of them I did become very good friends with, none of whom are still there. They're, anybody I was ever friends with or gold, except for a couple of people, they're gone. So it's just right. like. How about how about your interactions with David Miscavige then? Because what would happen, just so the viewers know, I mean, you guys would shoot whatever shots you had, and then the yeah. Russians would be developed and brought back, and then Miscavige would watch them usually with the director or whoever, and basically yeah. either approve them or not. And in yeah. the old days, before you were there, it would be his hair would be on fire every time he saw something, and that you know you guys can't do anything and go scrub the the kitchen and the galley yeah, or whatever. Yeah, I but, know. but was he was he more polite with you? I mean, oh totally. Are you, he was. Like? Oh no, I was like. No, it was part of the whole gaslighting of keeping me happy. It was crazy because um, I didn't have any lack of confidence in what I did. And it was easier to right. do it there because working at gold was kind of like, you know, I felt like, uh, like, like, you know, the, the, uh, I hope this doesn't sound racist, but I felt like the white explorer who crash landed on a primitive Island and, and, and the, the indigenous people were worshiping you as a God. I was like, I, I knew 20 people that had come to gold and done a, a, at least as good a job as I did, if not better. Right. But they hadn't been able to find anybody since when, since Hubbard vacated the post of director. And what year was that? Yeah. I mean, that was a long time well, ago. 1980, 1980 when he took off. Yeah. yeah. They'd never been able to find anybody. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was pretty crazy. So the, the way gold is set up, as you know, there's the, 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 what they call the lodges where editing is there's a, there's mm -hmm. a, about a 15 seat, pretty state of the art today. It's a very state of the art theater, film projection yeah. theater, 35 millimeter film. Well, back yeah. then we were shooting in 16. That was a two year battle to get them to switch to 35 millimeter. These people are scientifically just so stupid. 
um, ill educated, I should say. But uh, yeah, by the way, I set up all those lines too. You know what I mean? Yeah, so no, no, and they were all great. Yeah, they were yeah. all great. They were all great. It, I didn't know only, anything about how to do it, but I oversaw it. I didn't. Yeah, do I mean, it, the only so thing that was I wrong, just in it, a yeah. nutshell, was even though gold, all the Scientology films at that time were released on 16 millimeter, you don't want to shoot them on 16 millimeter. You want to shoot them on 35 millimeter, and then make reduction prints. It's right. even though the film costs more money in the long run, you're gonna you're gonna save. Uh, you're going to save that money and you're going to increase the quality of your product like a hundred times because it's just 16 millimeter is considered what's called a miniature format. So the that took two years. It weren't around when we did super eights. Oh no, I remember that they did <laughs> super eight and they had these little systems on the Regis desk, the little super eight, yeah. the little screens, really, really ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, miscavige yeah so the, the 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 there was a screening room where they did quote unquote rushes or dailies or whatever you want to call right. it depending on what country you're from and then it, within 100 yards 50 yards there's the dining room right mm -hmm. so um usually they he would watch rushes after his dinner right he'd go in the theater sit down and then i knew i always knew how long the rushes were because i shot them and then uh so I would just manage to be hanging around like, you know, a lot of people are just like, they want to run and hide because if they have a something uh, they submitted to Dave, but I would hate kind of loiter around. I'd be in editing or whatever. And then he'd come out and we'd talk and I rarely had, um, I didn't have a lot of re rejects. So it was really like for a good while, it was, it was good times for the crew, except they still kept dreaming up these horrific crises for them to go through you know especially having to do with events more so than the films but well I yeah i mean a lot mark a lot of people hate me because all the money i ever spent on scientology i got back working at gold and more <laughs> so, <laughs> so well no i mean but i just I, the reason i bring this up is i just yeah. wanted to comment because i dealt with all this stuff beforehand i mean uh -huh. you know like you mentioned we had to put you know we had to follow l ron hubbard's you know, advices and directives yeah. on how to shoot movies, right? And yeah. we had to put, I had to put together this packet of all those things called the Cine Bakes. This I, I, did, I did the course. And, I had to do yeah, your I know course, you did. Mark. I, you, you cover it in the book. Uh, yeah. And then I, also I had to gather all these films and we copied them from t film to video yeah. for people of great Hollywood movies. It was movies 200 films. It was the full yep. list. Was and then also films. we did the, um, uh, the books, the right. five seasons of cinematography and all that right. stuff. So I put all this stuff together. And then the idea was Hubbard wanted these people to train on them and all that. Right. But I think, I think, look, whether or not people agree with Scientology or anything like that, obviously your films were high quality when you did your first one. Yeah. And Miscavige obviously acknowledged it because as you mentioned in the book, he was then, you sent Greg Wilhair down to see you saying like, yeah, you know, Dave, Dave's really happy with what you're doing. And you know, he'd like you to, yeah. Continue, How right? much money do you want? How uh, your, your bridge is free. What, what will it take? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, uh, 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 so, so then Miscavige went and put my name personally. I was told by HCO, by the, the HR department that he personally put my name up on their organizing board. That made it impossible for me to leave without quitting Scientology, which I was not ready to do. And that was just, a that was like, everybody took that as a compliment. Like who wouldn't want that? It was just the most devious, treacherous move without really consulting me saying, what do you want? So that was yeah. just, I, I, that was kind of unforgettable. Well, they love bombed but, you, right? Didn't they love? Yeah, bomb totally. You? Yeah, like, totally. I mean, it, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. Um, you know, and well, then I, eventually I just, I, they built that studio. Well, gonna, yeah. So. Well, yeah. Well, I was going to, we're going to get that next, but what I was going to say is I had this realization reading your book, right? Which yeah. is that, you know, we Hubbard wanted to shoot these movies himself. That's right. what he wanted to do. He wrote the treatments. He he wanted his messengers and the crew to learn how to do this. And he wanted to direct them, right? But he was right. unable to do that, even though there were crappy films that he did. Okay. You know, you'll acknowledge that they were crap in terms of oh, the quality. They're, right? they're, you but can't he even. He wanted to do them. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. You can't. But I was just. Go ahead. I'm there's sorry. no words to describe. I mean, crappy. That's a compliment. Yeah. 
Yeah. These films. But, 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 what, but my point is, is that he wanted to do them. That's the whole reason right. why we were trying to get the base ready for his return before he died. In right, right, right. That's why, you know, I was charged with getting the materials ready and getting the cine crew manned up and getting them trained and right. getting, you know, the all the spaces done and all that, because the idea was get the all clear on the legal Hubbard would come back and then he could shoot his movies. But I will give David Miscavige credit for this. They kept to that because, oh, that's what L. Ron Hubbard said, except then he finally went, we're going to get a professional director, right? Yeah. And uh, I'll give him credit for coming up with that, you know, because yeah. that was something that would never have been considered before because these were L. Ron Hubbard's films, but he hired you and you were a professional and you knew what right. you were doing. And then you also mentioned in the book too, because then after a while, they started using professionals in other cinema. Yeah, cine yeah, a lot uh, of people came up. And all yeah. that. And guess what? All of a sudden, the movies yeah. were getting done, and they were high quality. And it just goes to show you that Hubbard's idea of like, oh, well, we could just train anybody for it. No, you got to learn in Hollywood. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I have my friend, yeah. you know him, who was the cameraman at Gold, who left around oh, yeah, the same yeah, yeah, time yeah. I did. Yeah. He, he then got into Hollywood and he started at the bottom in an equipment rental place and then eventually became a generator operator and a teamster and a driver and all that. Yeah. And he goes like, God, man, you know, that's the way you train people. And then yeah. he, he was like top of the board on all of his things for years. You know what I mean? Whereas in in the Scientology, it was like you did it yeah. Hubbard's way or forget it. Yeah. Am I right? I, yeah. You know, you're totally right. I mean, a few people. Hey, I put a picture in there, Mark. Can you can you pop it up just real yeah. quick? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you might have actually sent me this picture. I don't know, but I just wanted to <laughs> I just wanted to show the audience to see real quick that this is kind of overblown, you know, picture Hubbard had himself as a of himself as a film director and how completely yeah. ridiculous it is. Anyway, thanks for humoring me. Yeah, no, you're you're 100 percent right. I mean, I, I had some people reach out to me who I'd worked with for the first few years that I was up at Gold who said, hey, listen, because we're working with you, I was able to go out and get a career. And, and they've yeah. become really successful. So you kind of like, you need to be around people who really know what they're doing. I mean, you know, but then I was also forced to do things. You can take that picture down. I can't stand looking at it. We okay. we used to still work with that dolly, that ridiculous old movie, old dolly. Um, but I had to do things like Hubbard's way, like the way you're supposed to break a script down. You know, every scene you have to do a, you know, um, what's it, it? They didn't use the word, but it's called master scene coverage. But they dictated this very, very stupid way of breaking a scene down and the way you break the shots down. And so I had to shoot all those shots for every scene. I had to shoot the Hubbard breakdown for every scene. And then I would, I then it was like, because he said a director should get all the coverage he wants to get, I could then shoot the scene additionally how I wanted to shoot it. So it was. I can't imagine how many millions of dollars were wasted because they didn't just say, "Oh, just shoot it the way you want to." I had to shoot this, this system of you know master shots and long, sh you know, close-ups and extreme close-ups and blah 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 blah. And you do shoot a lot of those, but it was just like, you know, yeah. I mean, some there were some scenes I'm like, you know, I just there's like a five-minute piece of dialogue, and I'm like, I don't want to cut. I ain't gonna cut. So I'm just going to shoot one angle on this and I'll get a couple angles just for the heck of it. And they're like, but no, but no, that's not what Hubbard said. And then we'd end up cutting the film together and it would be the one shot that I wanted to do. So, well, and know. it's, it's kind of like if the viewers could imagine, it'd be like, you know, somebody telling Martin Scorsese or Quentin Tarantino. Well, that's a bit, how did, not, how did, I know Martin no, Scorsese. Yeah, but, no, 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 but I'm just yeah. saying, I'm just saying that because said that maybe they can yeah. understand who that is. Yeah, who's no, it is them, because oh, you yeah. have to shoot it this way, and yeah. in other words, yeah. you're supposed to let the director have the artistic yeah. vision and put together his film, not yeah, like and, 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 and everything he has to do. Yeah, and nobody on the set or uh, uh, would ever kind of violate that those roles, except you were held to the standard of having to do things the way uh, Hubbard said to do them, and then you know. And then every once in a while, you know, Miscavige would look at the shots, but he was just supposed to look at them technically from the viewpoint of Scientology. But he was also like a, a, an aesthetic thought leader. Like he was like, this is a man with no taste. This is a man right. who was raised by uh, a kind of a, a, a tasteless trumpeter from Philly. Just I, no offense to any but tasteless trumpeters or Philly or anything, but <laughs> this was not like a really educated home in terms of, 
you know, aesthetics and taste and so forth. But somehow Miscavige had managed, I guess, in an, as narcissistic narcissists do, to sort of, you know, hoover in a, a, enough aesthetics like maybe Tom Cruise makes a comment or I make a comment or somebody else. And then all of a sudden it becomes his. So he used to kind of also lord over the aesthetics of my films, which really bothered me because most of the time it was fine. But sometimes he'd want me to redo something. And it wasn't even because it wasn't right. It was just not the way he wanted it done. That would really piss me off. That's where my artistic heart started to become poisoned because it was like, oh, you know, you don't have, once you give that over, you're really done it's kind of like, even though I'm now I'm broke and I'm gonna been unemployed for three years and whatever, I'm not looking for a job because I'm trying to create some projects and really like have it yeah. come from where I am as an artist because I had the opposite for so many years. But that's uh, that's just just my little sob story. So <laughs> well, I'm I'm gonna move on now because obviously you proved yourself, you proved yourself, and then obviously they, you then signed up for more films and all that. And then they got rid yeah. of the gym, and they built yeah. this huge seventy thousand square foot. Yeah, they. Studio and, at I the can't base. tell you how many times some staff members said, "You know, Dave built that for you. He built that for you." You know, like trying really? to make me feel bad. Because, well, I was going to ask you uh, some questions about how did they build that? Like, obviously, the RPF did not build this thing. Oh right? no, that was all private contractors. A professional contract. Yeah, that was a that? bunch of private contractors. I mean, because they're in not just an earthquake zone, they're in the 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 uh, the the what do you call it? The uh, the fault map of, on gold. It looks like a broken right. windshield. Like right. it's just there's you can't you can't swing a dead cat without hitting the fault. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just they have what's called liquefaction out there, which means if there's a a decent earthquake, the ground will turn to liquid and everything will sink. They have the worst possible scenario because gold is in a 500 year flood basin. It all used to be right. water. So it's got that sand underneath it. So they had to keep, they wanted to build it out in that space and where, where the dining room is, you know, there's a huge meadow. They originally wanted to build it there and the, the engineers wouldn't stand for it. So they had to keep marching West, 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 West. And, and it's kind of far away. It's a few hundred yards away, but this was the most stable place. So they had to hire a lot of engineers. They had to hire a lot of outside contractors. Mark Headley reported to me uh, there was a lot of uh, overruns and a lot of contractors mm -hmm. overcharged them. You know, crooks get taken a lot. Like, you know, scammers <laughs> are like the first ones to be scammed. So apparently they got <laughs> scammed a lot. But I, I could tell you a really, I mean, it, this castle, it, it's a great facility. It's world class because the problem with gold is not the facilities, it's how they treat their staff. Uh, but there's a really funny story about this. They kept torturing me about, you need to tell us every film you think you're ever going to make so we can figure out what kind of studio to build. And I'm like, that's not possible because as soon as I have that facility, I'm going to start making films I never even envisioned making them. It's kind of like asking somebody if they like sushi before they've ever had sushi. You're like, come on, right. tell me every kind of sushi you like, but I've never had sushi. Doesn't matter. So anyway, um, so I, I, I kept saying you need to build it as big as you can afford. And because I, I kept getting like in trouble, literally like ethics trouble for saying things like, you just need to build it as big as you can afford. So every time they would complete a design, Miscavige would say, well, let's make it a little bigger. And so they'd make it another, you know, uh, five feet bigger, right? And then it would only cost a little bit more. And then he kept expanding and expanding and expanding it. And then at a certain point, he said, no, that's as big as we can make it. We can't afford it anymore. And then I said, no, you should make it more than you can afford because what will happen is it will increase your production and you will have wished you would have gone into debt a little bit because now you can afford it and guess where they stopped they stopped exactly where i told them to stop right at the point where they could no longer afford it so they'd done all these case studies and all this engineering and all this stuff when all they had to do was just build it as big as they could afford it it's just like a simple mm -hmm. rule so anyway then the first film i shot in there i guess which was good because it it really made the point um was the one with isaac hayes that took place on like another planet right. and we right. needed it was heavy visual effects heavy and it needed to be shot in front of a gigantic uh psych which like a green screen and it literally took up the whole studio so it was like how can i tell you what kind of films we're going to shoot we're only going to shoot the kind of films you can shoot when you have the facility so i made sure to do that the first film we did could not have been shot in any other facility so you know a lot of crazy stories and, and just there no, I, 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 
my questions were like, how did it get built? Up? Professional contractors, obviously, because there's oh no yeah, way. no, they brought people in. They brought up contractors. Yeah. You know, the, and the, it's it's a beautiful building. I mean, yeah, you know, well, I'm the sure building probably was state of the art. Was it state of the art really for the time? Yeah, I mean, the building is like stucco. It's like it, it's like some Orange County Disneyland version of a castle. It's all mm -hmm. stucco and it has foam underneath it. And I think it's just kind of hideous. But inside, the actual physical facility is great. All the aesthetics of this building are just really, I think, very compromised by the sort of lack of taste and, you know, like making the crew make all the furniture and all this crazy shit like that. You know, by the time they get to Scientology Media Productions, which I helped to set up, then they'd hired a world-class architectural firm. And that whole place is just like eater with a spoon, aesthetic eye candy. So, you know, because that whole place was done by pros. This was not. I have, I have that. That's coming up here in a minute. Okay, so, good. Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Anyway, so that that's basically became your home with the Cine Shoot Crew filming, filming films. Yeah, you can see. Do you right? see in the foreground where those, there's those three gables on the ceiling? Yeah. There's like three gable windows. Okay, that was my office was under that roof. Okay. Okay. <laughs> where was the so, main entrance? Was it, was it around uh, there? Well, the main the entrance is where that circular driveway is on the left, on the left side. right. Yeah, yeah. But the, really, the it, there was a bunch of entrances. Like, we always walked in. The, that you know where that I pointed out where the office was, and then there was an you know this entrance is all over the place. The the the, the sets the crew the sets guys walked around back or whatever because there was multiple entrances. So, but do you want to yeah. notice what there isn't, Mark? If you know, look real closely around that castle, no yeah. place to sit down outside. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. No smoking area. You smoked inside if you had to smoke, right? Or you definitely no. You went outside, but you stood up and you walked around and you made yeah. sure you looked busy. You held your cell phone if you had one, and you walked around pretending while you were smoking that you were talking on the cell phone so that somebody wouldn't write an idle report on you. Fucking okay, places. So I'm, gonna move, I'm, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I'm going to move along because again, okay. this is in your book and all that, and you're going yeah, to yeah. and stuff, right? So at some point, obviously, you became. And you you talk about this in the book, but you became part of David Miscavige's inner circle, and I know what that feels like. It's because he trusted you to get things done. Yeah, you know, you talk yeah. about doing the life exhibit, L. Ron Hubbard life exhibition museum, yeah. which you'd never done a museum before, and then you yeah. did the cult, whatever the but I knew I could do it. History of death the, or history yeah, of the psychology. industry of death museum. Yeah, but I knew I could industry do it. It was death. like the second I was asked, I'm like, oh, cool, this is great because it's the same. You know, I I had been really steeped in design and architecture and film and multimedia and like the, I, those exhibitions were um, you know I would love to do another one someday for a good purpose because I think exhibitions are a lot of fun they're it's a great creative experiences but yeah so, so I yeah, solved these problems you were able yeah to no, use your skills yeah you were yeah, able no, to use your skills you're right as like the uh, the life exhibition was a disaster and so I think I'd done maybe two films at Golden and Miss Cavage said oh you gotta you know you gotta help us with the life exhibition I worked with Mike Rinder on that. That's the first time I really worked with Mike because he was LRH Peeper in at that time. He was not working with OSA. And um, I ended up spending seven months on it. I couldn't believe it. I came up there to do one film. And then they said, okay, I'll do some more films. And I made a very specific uh, list of those films. And then all of a sudden, I can't even do that because I'm like, you got to go to LA. Please, we need you to do this. Please, please, please. And it's like they're always dangling something like there's a big bonus or there's money or, hey, you'll be able to work closer to home or it's just always something. It's just. But, yeah, I had the same thing with the life exhibition. Total disaster. Go in there. No, and it, tear, yeah. No, but the, my point, my point being just for our viewers uh, yeah. to understand, because I only was in Miscavige's orbit for six years before I started to see the abuses. That's a long year. time. Mark. And, That's six no, years. And it was a long time. That's an and eternity. Also, also, just so the viewers know. Mitch, even though he was at the base, he would not have seen how Miscavige treated no. the staff, which he covers in the book in detail. And yeah. because it's a 600 acre property and he didn't do yeah. it in front of a professional or somebody who might was not a Sea Org right. member. He didn't do that in front of people like Mitch Brisker. Right. But well, I did after a while. Yeah, no, I know. I know. But I'm yeah. just saying I'm just saying it didn't happen. That's right. And That's right. Like I never I knew that the, I, the the week probably the week I came up, he was punching you in the face in motor pool. Right, right. I and, like and, had and no most idea. People didn't know that. No, most right. people didn't know that because right. it was not talked about. No. And so I just went, "This is crazy." I'm getting out of here, and I left. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, but I just wanted to mention that when you when I I gathered 
speaker. I gained that that trust from him when I was setting up the different audio and right. video lines and things right. like that, because he could then be in Los Angeles and he knew he could trust me to get it done and do a good job. Right. And I'm sure that right. was the same for you. Yeah, and totally. that, that had that had certain perks and benefits. Oh, yeah. Like, I've talked. I've talked about. I've got bonuses just like other people yeah. in, in RTC. Yeah. And also, I got like you said, I got my auditing and things like right. that, which I got priority over other people. And I'm, that's unfortunate. I'm not. You know, trust me. I. I. The, the the way the staff were treated and all that was abominable, and I was really sorry about all that stuff. But you know, that's basically how Miscavige would keep you right. on the hook, because yeah. then when he turns on you, which he did on me. He right. turned on me and did attack my wife, put her in the RPF, and then right. I turned on him. Then you're like persona non grata, and yeah, and he he can't wait to you know get rid of you. You know, I just wanted the viewers to understand that. Um, but I was going to ask you, yeah, what was no, it like being totally in true. his? What was it like being in his inner circle? Well, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, before I go on, I keep meaning to say that you compiled those books for the the, the film guys to study at Gold. I just have to tell you, you did a really good job because you found some of the most seminal books on on the syllabus of some of the best film teaching institutions in America, uh, starting with the five C's of cinematography. Uh, so uh, hats off to you, Mark, for doing that because those those Thank were you. those are really good books. You know, Millerson. I still use uh, them to this day when I'm pointing yeah. my camera. I'm, oh I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. The Millerson's book on lighting. The Spottiswood book on editing. These are yeah. like seminal books that that have are still not outdated because they deal with really deep principles and stuff. So, you should put your the 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 list of film books on your site and say, hey, I, you know, because if anybody wants to learn film, those are all really good books. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so even though like today we're editing digitally, the book on editing is done by a very famous British editor, and it's the philosophy behind editing which still is, is, it's not about the tools and whether you're editing on film or but being in Miscavige's inner circle. Wow. It, it's, it's, um, it's a little stressful because you like, I always knew the closer I got that I was going to be eviscerated someday. Like, like, was I going to actually escape unscathed from this? You know, and, and like the worst of it was when I flew to England with them on, with he and Lou, his girlfriend on Tom Cruise's jet. And then uh, Lou came to me. I was going back to L.A. They were going on to Ireland and uh, uh, they'd invited me to go with them. I didn't want to for a number of different reasons. I just didn't. Because uh, so she came to see me and she said, you know, we would like you to take a larger role in the organization. I don't know what she was talking about to this day. Maybe it was, you know, because I got reposted to SMP as the senior director. I don't know. But I tell you, Mark, when she said that to me, like in any other corporate situation, you'd be thinking, this is great. I've achieved success. But in that organization, I was like, I'm a goner. That's, this is, that's it. I'm done. If, if his top lieutenant is coming to me saying, we'd like you to play a larger role in the organization, that's it. My life's over. And sure enough, within a few months, I was in trouble. I was busted, sent back to gold. Miscavige didn't never turned on me. He had people do it. So he had people do it for yeah. him because that was another one of his techniques. All right. Well, let me move on. Okay. Because okay. these are some various huge, huge events in Scientology. One is this is Lisa McPherson. Yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, yeah. she died in like the late 1990s uh, yeah, due to yeah. being, you know, abused by Scientology and their care. And Miscavige had right. an involvement in that and all that sort of stuff. The reason I'm asking you, though, about this is not a, a, to go into the Lisa McPherson thing. But right. what was it like being around Miscavige at that time? Because my understanding was he went to Clearwater full time. Yeah, where totally. You then just left to go ahead and yeah, do and never, Yeah, hardly and ever saw that. him. What happened was um, I didn't know totally what was going on. I knew that he and Mike and some other people were in Clearwater uh, handling a legal case. I'd heard about the tragic death of Lisa McPherson. Uh, yeah, Miscavige was just gone. Before he left, he came to me, or he wrote me a dispatch, as we call it, a communication, a dispatch. And he said, um, I had sent him a film to approve, right? So remember, every day we do those shots, and then I would have to write a CSW, which is, stands for, you've described this, Completed Staff right, Completed work. Staff Work. Yeah. yeah. And did you know, Mark, I, there was, I found a manual up at Gold, the CSW, it was, did, you must know this, I think, it was taken from the Air Force manual. Yeah, it's like a military thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a thing in the Air Force manual that it says Completed Staff Work and the same thing. Right. But you'd have to write a detailed proposal about why what you did was okay. So I would have to do this every day. It was a very time-consuming and that, 
that's when, you know, Greg Wilher came to me and assigned me an assistant, which turned out to be Lisa Schroer, one of the, like, like the, turned out to be one of the most evil people in the world. You talk but, about uh, her in the book too. <laughs> yeah, I do. I wrote about her. I, I wrote, it was funny because Mike Rinder was very nicely reading my book. Uh, uh, it, it, with no time, he was flying to Philadelphia for a, uh, for a, a convention of that that nonprofit that he's on the board of, and he literally printed my book. I read it on the plane, made a bunch of notes, and one of his biggest notes was, "You nailed Lisa Schroer." So I was really happy about that. You know, and it's like funny I nailed the description I, of her. Well, I, it's funny because in reading your book, that's not the Lisa Schroer that I knew. You know what I mean? And it's it just shows how corrupted these people. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. She was a sweet girl. When I knew Mark, her, Mark, you know she mean? was two years my. She had no sister. position of power. She had no position of power. No, when no, I was no, 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 no. She, she, but she was very conniving. Even when you knew her, she just didn't show it. She yeah. got herself busted in Seattle. This is really inside baseball. Sorry for our viewers. She was, I think, she was the HCO receptionist for CMO Int. Not yeah. a big job. Not a big job. For years. Right? For, for years. years. Yeah. She yeah. was one answering the phones. Yeah. Yeah, answering the phones. <laughs> So she gets busted, right? And then I, I need an assistant. Greg Wilher walks into my office and I'm just pulling my hair out because I had hair then. I'm pulling my hair out because I'm trying to get the CSW done. I had to get it to Miscavige for rushes. You know, you don't want to keep him waiting for rushes, right? So uh, uh, Wilher assigned Lisa and she, we became good friends. She helped me. She was hugely, but she's conniving the whole time to use this as a platform to launch herself to power. From her post as my assistant, which... Miscavige created the post of the director's assistant, which is not an assistant director. He he, la she launched from that post into being the commanding officer of Golden Era Productions. I know. Yeah, and I then she floored. became. I was floored when you yeah. said that. <laughs> yeah, no, because it was that was a thing you could do. Like people would would attach themselves to me, Sea Org members. Because they thought they could then use that as a launching pad, like because yeah, I yeah, it's like, like a social climbing type of thing. Yeah, Literally, it is, I and mean, so. I had and a, it wasn't, a lot. You didn't used to be like that, but right. I'm just saying with Miscavige, yeah, obviously. Yeah, no, I had was, a lot like of people. You wanted that to I, get in his favor, and yeah. so you attacked other people, and you beat yeah, and them I, up, and you do so stuff. So a lot of know? people that I thought were my friends were just, it was like, it was worse than Hollywood. It, like, in other words, yeah. backstabbing people that are trying to just yeah. use their connections to get somewhere. And it's, it's just a lot sicker up there because nobody has anything. You know, status is based on your post title or if you have a cell phone or a beeper, you know, then you're. Well, and, and it also becomes a, a survival mechanism for the staff member that they figure that if I don't beat up or yell at this person, then they're going to beat up or yell at me. You know what I mean? You know, yeah, I, you know, that's yeah. How, that's how twisted it became. Yeah, I you know? I described it as the Miscavige style of management is if you're a junior, as the people under you are, do not fear you. You are considered a bad manager, and that is very much a, a well, goal. I, I'll, I'll give you, and not to not to toot my own horn, right? But the, uh, that was the biggest criticism that that Shelley Miscavige had about me, which is that. Mark, you never get, you never yell at anybody. You need to get yeah, tougher. Yeah, you need to yeah, yell at people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah, that wasn't the yeah, way yeah. that I handled things. Funny. I no. actually would go in after Dave went in and tore somebody's face off. Yeah. I'd then stick around and say, okay, let's figure out how we can get this done. What do you need? How can we fix this? How could you get it done? You know what I mean? It was not, it was not like, you need to do this and blah, 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 yeah, blah, blah. No, or what was that one that uh, Jenny DeVock did? Uh, you know, oh, COB. To me? Oh, you're it. You're it. You. You're it. COB is counting on you. You're it. Like to see that, that stuff. doesn't solve anything. Well, you know what I mean? I, yeah, I just have to point out this one thing, Mark. Okay, so you know those, there's this incredibly, and a lot of your viewers do too. There's this incredibly important seminal work called uh, Sur Science of Survival, right? Mm -hmm. And boy, if you read this book, you know everything about human prediction. This is uh, the prediction of human behavior. This is the book that says. At the emotional tone level of 1.1, that's where you find your homosexual, your pervert, your blah 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 blah. But as it goes up the tone scale, this is this is Scientology, right? It says at 4.0, which is a very high tone, that a person at that tone level will inspire people around them to creative efforts. And so that was your viewpoint was well, you, you can because you can't you can't inspire people around you, but there is was to put people in fear. So they weren't even following this, the edicts of L. Ron Hubbard when they were doing that. The place is, is, and it started with Hubbard, it's a bottomless pit of hypocrisy, like because there's so much of what they preach that they don't follow. And I'm not saying that if they preach what they follow, it would be a good movement. It would, it would be corrupt. 
uh, from day one. It's just rotten to the core. It's a con game. There's, a, there's nothing about it that's good. I just anyway, don't, I don't want to be mis on that tangent. I, what's that? No, I don't know how we got off on that tangent. It was Lisa Schroer, but anyway, yeah. but then it just made me yeah. remember that that's not the way that people treated each other. But then no. it became that way, and that's when I was like, "I'm out of here." Well, you know, there but, were, still, but Mark, you remember there were a lot of people that were really nice to one another. But it was, absolutely, were, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But they were and, key and, in and the listen, and I, they're good people too. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, deep down inside, they're good people. Yeah, they're, they're there for the reason not to not to do evil things they're there they think they're saving the world you know yeah no it's totally true yeah i mean they weaponize people's empathy they weaponize their 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 vulnerability they they do all kinds of crazy shit and there's there's a lot of good people that are trapped into scientology one of the reasons i didn't speak out for a while is because there's some people at gold that i really care about and i thought well i i'm just going to live my life i'm not going to go back and spit in their ice cream but then i realized right. you know that keeping silent never helps the abused it only helps the abuser, and that the more I speak up, maybe they'll get to have some of their life before it's over, because there are there's some good people up there. So, yeah. Anyway, then there was this other thing that you mentioned in the book, in your book about the oh, yeah. rundown came out, yeah. which was yeah. in the St. Petersburg Times in yeah. 2009, and this was uh, this was when Marty Rathbun and Mike Rinder. Right. Uh, but Mike, Mike wasn't actually, he was behind the scenes on this because he hadn't come out fully yet, but Marty yeah. was involved and then Amy and, and, uh, and I, and then right. eventually in the second round, I was in there about getting beat up by Miscavige, et cetera, right. et cetera. And you mentioned in the book that Ms. when this came out, Miscavige diverted his flight from yeah. going down to the free winds yeah. and came to Clearwater and met yeah. up with you, right? Yeah. Me what and was another that guy. Like? I mean, it was, was it was, like? it was and, so freaky. What was uh, his reaction? That was what I okay. wanted to get. I'm going to tell you. So what year was this? I'm trying to remember the tooth rundown. 2009. 2009. 2009. Okay, I, so this, yeah. this was after Anonymous. Anonymous was in 2008. Right. Okay, so right. you can kind of fold my, my career working for the church. You can fold it in half before Anonymous, after Anonymous. I mean, literally. Because up until Anonymous, I was only uh, I was a white hat guy. I, I made films. I made positive propaganda. I made TV ads. I lived in this tunneled world where everything was, you know, we were going to save the planet. And then starting with Anonymous, I got pulled into pushing back against this, these quote unquote evil forces. You know, I got pulled in there because there was not a lot of smart people. They needed someone to like vet the, the writing. I, I made videos that looked like, you know, bad trailers for you know, a sci-fi film, you know, pushing against Anonymous. You know, we kept trying to spin them as an organization because Miscavige can't deal with, he can't deal with public opinion because there's nobody to, who do you attack? You know, no, another subject, but that's why they can't deal with the TikTok army. That's public opinion. That's not an organization. So um, uh, the, the thing came out, I knew about the article. I hadn't read it, but I knew about it. And because I'd been working on the Anonymous stuff, I wasn't one of, I was no longer siloed. I was expected to see all that stuff. Like if that would have come out and let's say that Lou, you know, Dave's girlfriend would have come to me and said, did you see the St. Pete times, the, the article, the truth run done? And if I would have said, no, she would have said, what's your problem? You don't give a shit about what's going on. Like literally no, I, I, I got put no, in I that. Know the, I know the feeling. Marty Rathbun said the same thing when he was in Clearwater. He was doing training when Lisa McPherson happened. He wasn't even involved with any yeah. of the OSA stuff at the time. But but when Miscavige called on the phone, he said, why aren't you involved in this? In other words, yeah, like, exactly, you should have known exactly. to just jump in and handle it. You know yeah, so I, mean? I would see everything. I mean, I knew what was going on, right? Because I, I, I never knew if I was going to be called. I got called like to do a squirrel buster thing, fly down to Texas and uh, harass Marty. But I'm like, I hated Marty. I hated him from the day I met him till the till today. He's just a, a really sick person. Yeah. He's just yeah. a complete weasel. Uh, Mike, it was a good friend. And I, I have a lot of respect to this day for Mike. Mike has gone through his own trauma and is, you know, whatever. Um, and I, I, I think he's done a lot to make up for whatever it is he may have done or not done, but we always had a very good relationship. But anyway, so I get this call, you need to fly to Clearwater. I don't know what the hell is going on. And they say, we're sending a car to your house. You need to go to Clearwater. Right. It's like, I don't know. It's like eight o'clock at night on a Friday or something. I don't remember, but I was at home in LA. And so I'm like, you know, shoot, I better pack a bag. So I, I get back before I'm done. There's a car outside waiting. You know, there's like a, like a, you know, like a, a town car waiting to take me to the airport. Right. 
So I'm like a real quick, I throw my bag in the car, I hop in there, I go down there, I meet another guy that I was working with who was a writer. And I didn't really write him in there in the book because I don't, I think his part was really insignificant. So then I got, I get taken into the, to the Fort Harrison and I don't have to do any of the shit. Like I go in there and the routing form is filled out for me already. All I got to do is sign it because they know who I am. And I'm not staff, I'm public. So I got to go in through the front door and get a nice room and all that shit because I'm being treated like a VIP. So I get led into really like the presidential suite, whatever that room is they have in the Fort Harrison. It's just like on the top floor and it's like insane. Like, like there's a grand piano in there and it doesn't even take up any room. Like it's that big. And David, he's a mess, man. He's a disaster. He's like a so beaten up and he's, you know, hasn't shaved in days and he looks like shorter than he usually does. And, you know, he's always kind of shockingly height challenge, which is, I don't blame him for that because it's not something he did. I blame him for other things, but, and it, you know, he's like wearing a t-shirt and he's just like, and, and his hair's mussed up and he's sitting like a little kid on the sofa and he's just telling me about, they did this on purpose. I know they did this on purpose. They know I'm on the way to the ship. They know I'm about to do uh, the, you know, the maiden voyage and Marty and Mike and Marty and Mike and Marty and Mike. And he's just going on and on and on and on and on. To this day, Mark, I was never asked to do anything about that. I just flew down there, just hung out, for, there. hung out for a couple of days, listened to him fucking complain and I, I kept waiting for like, we need you to write a website, you know, work on some, write something, you know, blah, 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 do something, nothing. And I flew back to LA. It was just crazy. You know, I ate. Well, but, but, but when you said he was complaining, was he just complaining nonstop just complaining. about Mike and Marty? And nonstop the that were about the Mike article? and Marty. And also about uh, what the, uh, uh, Tim, uh, t -t 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 the two writers. Uh, uh, God, oh, uh, Tom sure. Tobin and, and, uh, uh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. The, the writers yeah, to the Tobin and whatever. And I knew I had known them because remember they did yeah they the interviewed me out for the article. Yeah, yeah, when they did the piece about uh, Joe yeah. Childs, Joe yeah, Childs and Tom, Tom Tobin. Tobin. Yeah, yeah. So do you remember a few years before the Truth Rundown, they had done another piece called "The Man Behind Scientology," who's a big yes. yeah, and they were sort of softball. They were they like treated Miscavige decently. They made him feel this, this photo was from that when they did yeah that that's the one article. yeah the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's from that earlier article. And so they came to Golden. I talked to them for a couple hours about what an awesome leader Miscavige was because at that point, I was like, you know, I was willing to be paid to lie. And I was yeah. willing to, and there was a lot that I didn't know. So I sat there for an hour and I said, yeah, you know, I've had plenty of, I've worked for plenty of people. And I got to tell you, you know, I know, I've heard stories about Bill Gates and, and, and which I had, and you know, people that had worked at Microsoft at top levels. And, I heard a story from a friend of mine who, when Steve Jobs was the next, he was hired to do some fundamental design work for the company and about what a, what a dick Steve Jobs was. Da, 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 but whatever, these are just people talking. So, But I could relay these kind of anecdotes and say, yeah, when you have people in these positions, you're always going to hear somebody is going to get their, ruffled, their feathers are going to get ruffled because there's a lot at stake. Of course, in Scientology, it's not just the, the shareholders' investment that's at stake. It's the entire consciousness of all human existence from this time forward. So, because you know that's how what cults do. They 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 operate at a high level of what, what's in, at stake if we don't make it. So, right. yeah, it was crazy. I went down there. I hung out, ate a bunch of you know uh, Kobe beef sliders or thousand dollar sushi plates or specialty coffee or whatever the hell he, you know, because he lives like a super celebrity. And um, then I flew back, and it was just weird. That's wild. Well, and then uh, there are other ones too. Uh, we're going to skip forward to the Scientology Meter Productions because. Uh, oh sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I was just fascinated in the book where you mentioned about how Miscavige reacted to these things because obviously, you know, like I could care less what he thinks about me, but I'm sure me and yeah. Janice <laughs> and Marty and Mike yeah. and you know, everybody that's that's been speaking up, you know, basically, you know. 30 years later, he's still going, those were dirty, rotten. Whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm in Scientology Media Production. It's like 2016, right? And I'm being handed a folder full of hate site content and said, hey, Mitch, could you go through this? And just because, you know, they, you know, I'm really good with words and da, 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 da. So, you know, I could take some hacks work and polish it up, right? And I don't, I didn't mind doing that because it's like, it's no sweat. And I was, you know, I've, I've come out in public and apologized for kind of being kind of, uh, not a real boy, 
but I'm really trying to be like an authentic person after those years of doing all that. But, and then I open it up and there's Mark Fisher. I don't know Mark Fisher. There's Mark Fisher and all this horrible stuff. And like, I'm like, what the fuck? So I'm thinking, wait a minute, this guy, I didn't even get to meet this guy. He left in 1990. And I'm like, what, what, why is this news? Jesse Prince. The three that I saw that day was you, Jesse Prince, and Karen De La Carrier. These are like, you guys have been out forever, right? Like, forever. <laughs> yeah. And here he is. And he's still completely, completely stuck on it. So, yeah. And then they yeah. also had a guy, I'm not going to mention his name because he's gone and and uh, he really just deserves to live his life. And he was a professional journalist who had worked for the Hollywood Reporter, which is weird because the Hollywood Reporter was a big enemy of Scientology. Right. Uh, but he was also working on the hate sites because he'd been fired from the reporter and he's a good, good writer. So uh, anyway, it was just a crazy, there was this crazy little time at S&P. But I'm sorry, you wanted to ask something else about S&P. No, I just was going to say, it's just... It's just like having these little demons running around at his head all the time. Yeah, it's you know nuts. I mean, I mean what's like, the point? Constantly like, you know, yeah, what's like, the point? Where are the strawberries? You know what I mean? Yeah, who, exactly. Who took the strawberries? Kane Mutiny, you know what I mean? And he's yeah, got his little dice things, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, hey, Mark, if, there's so, if you can adjust it, your camera went a little out of focus. If that's Yeah, I know. Right. it. Did. I'm going to go out and come right back in. Just okay, hold good. One second, okay? Yeah, I'm going to tell the people a story. Okay, so the, the, there you are. Okay. That better? But, yeah. Yeah, but the... The weirdest thing about Scientology Media Productions is when Miscavige first started talking to me about that he was looking for another studio. And this was probably this, in I've 20, got pictures here I was going to show you. Yeah, this was I, I'm talking early 2000s. He's starting to look right. for a studio. And anybody's interested, that's the old KT, KCET studios. Between purchasing it and renovating it, they spent $100 million. That photo of the opening day is not Photoshopped. I was there. There, that is not a fake photo. That is pretty much every Scientologist in LA got to get in there and eat uh, expensive lobster rolls from a food truck. Now, who the hell doesn't want to do that? So, right. <laughs> anyway, they had the parking lot full of food trucks. But anyway, yeah. So th he spent a hundred million dollars on this place, and he, and the reason he did it was he said, "I'm going to get my own TV station, and I'm going to fuck them up." That was his exact phrase. I'm going to F them up. What he meant was he was so sick of what he thought was being uh, mistreated by the media that he thought if he got his own media platform, he could turn the tables and expose them. And he was paying huge amounts of money to, to outside investigative journalists to investigate Tom Tobin and Joe Childs and Tracy McManus from the, you know, from the uh, Tampa, right, Bay Tampa Bay Times. And, 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 and uh, what's his name? Uh, Wright, Lawrence Wright and Alex yep. Gibney. Then he Tony was going to, yeah, he was going to be bombarding the airwaves with these exposés on these guys. And he was going to call it Freedom TV, which was, you know, an evolution of Freedom Magazine which, you know, side note, they haven't even published since 2019 because all the journalists quit because they all can't stand Miscavige. And, right. and I know that for a fact because I've spoken with a number of them. Uh, and they've told me exactly why they, they can't stand them, and it's pretty horrible. Uh, but they never did Freedom TV. It's the whole reason they built the studio. There's a, there's a picture somewhere on their website. It's in the video about the studio. There's a picture that I should have put it up. It's, it says freedom, and it's like a set on which they were going to shoot Freedom TV. They could never get the thing launched, so they turned Scientology Media Productions. They turned the TV network. It, it's just nothing but puffy infomercials and self-serving pieces. You know, so it's it's a, people don't realize that this place, this is a $100 million disaster. This is $100 million of, of tax-free money that was donated by people who thought they were doing something good. So, yeah, and, oh, exactly. it's, and, and the place is way more toxic than gold ever was. Well, FYI. and it's, it's so big. It's so big. And they've spent a lot of money, like you said, that it makes me wonder, you know, whatever happened to, you know, uh, this monstrosity? I mean, they've got this seventy-three thousand oh, square yeah. foot well, that's, studio yeah. at Golden Air Productions, yeah. and now they got this big TV studio yeah. with big studios, right? In it. Well, okay, here, yeah, no, the studios. So, I, so is this the, just a white elephant just sitting there? No, not doing no, anything? it's actually not. It's kind of sad. Um, 
Okay, so the two studios at SMP, Scientology Media Productions, are relatively small. You could fit both of them in this studio and still have room left mm -hmm. over. They're not big studios. Uh, you know, they're very state of the art. They've been all renovated, blah, blah, blah. They're really like small studios for doing like TV interview type stuff. But so, and they've never used them. They've never shot anything in the studios at Scientology Media Productions. Right. Even they're, though just, they spent, they're just there. They're just there. They're, no, they use them. I don't know if you remember this, Mark. You might have had something to do with this, but when Miscavige would do an event, he would get all of these videos shot from all over the world. Like my good friend Rachel Hastings was one of the camera people, and she would go around, they'd shoot, and then they'd come back, and then the editors would assemble them, uh, assemble the material, and then they would print out paper frames from frame, right? They and they'd print out all the, the the transcripts from the interviews, and then they would lay out tables in the studio, lay miles of tables and then they would they would do what's called a paper edit they lay out all the printouts that's all they use the studios for they use them for doing paper edits for for these fake documentaries that they show at events to keep scientologists believing that scientology is expanding and doing good things in the world so what they do up at gold is they still do very high-end film work if you look at the Scientology TV network, you'll see some programming is looks is very filmic. It's much more like films than documentaries. They shoot that at goal. The the commercials they do at the uh, on the the whatever you call it the uh, the Super Bowl. They shoot those at gold. So gold has become this backwater. It's kind of like a Swiss watchmaking factory. That's in, up in a little village in Switzerland that hand makes beautiful little watches. Like that's what it is. It hand makes these beautiful little films that get shown on the Scientology network. And all of the, it used to be the seat of power for all of Scientology when you were there. And now it's just a backwater film studio making beautiful little Swiss watches. And then all the managers that used to run Scientology internationally, they're either painting sets or they're scanning documents or doing some stupid, like mind numbing job. But that, that studio is, absolutely working and they remake tech films because they're going to remake them forever the training films that i made they, they remake those forever let me make i just gonna open the door for my dog one second oh yeah no problem no problem <laughs> anyway hey it's great to see all anyway. you guys if you have any questions yeah I, I hope i hope we get to answer oh we got some well, good here dark, okay good let me let me go back i, I want to make yeah, go ahead that I thought yeah, about please. this, about this Scientology media productions, which you you said in your book is basically Miscavige's, you know, main lair when he's in Los yeah, Angeles. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. That's right. Um, but my question is this: the whole Scientology network is a deal that they did with Directv, right? And well, yeah, I think you mentioned. I mean, yeah, partially. It's, it's direct, also because it's on direct TV. It's on direct, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Satellite TV. All right, but they pay ten million. Did you say ten million dollars? Yeah, I think it was ten million. I'm pretty sure it was ten million dollars. That was for a multi-year deal, because Miscavige, uh, you know, he he didn't want to get booted off after a year. He was really worried, so he. Uh, but well, no, my, my what I thought about, you know, because you know people are doing protests and stuff out in front of the science yeah. boards, the audits yeah. and things like that, and all that, and you know. Scientology has, you know, gone after like uh, producers of like Scientology in the Aftermath and Leah Remini's right, game right. show to get her off the air and things like right. that. Why couldn't why couldn't grassroots people that are watching our channel or whatever start going towards Direct TV and start pointing out all the abuses of Scientology and like I, what the yeah, hell I, are you I doing I, I having mean, that this channel be... on your on your satellite system? Yeah, you know yeah, I, mean? I guess. I mean, I've tried. I, I reached out to some of the TikTok crew. I'm I'm re I'm reluctant to talk to try to inter interface with them because they're doing such an incredible job on their own. They don't yeah. need my help. They don't need anybody's help. So I'm sort of reluctant to say, hey, guys, but I did reach out to one person and I would like to do it is um, I think, you know, Chris without a Hellcat, he's the kid. I, I, I met him down at the I went down to the down to the you know, I went down to the protest, but I went down there to hand these out in front of the in front. I don't yeah. know if you saw this, but yeah, I went I down there. To, yeah. And, and on the back, it has my public apology for helping to put that test center together. But I met Chris without a Hellcat. He's the kid with the megaphone that you right. hear yelling and he does such a great job that I, I wanted to get them to go down to SMP. I said, come on guys, I'll go down there with you. Ms. Gavage's office is down there and you need to ask him what happened to freedom TV. Why is there no right. freedom? I mean, there's a bunch of stuff they could be asking him, but maybe we'll do it. Maybe we won't, but I think I got off your point. 
No, my point was just that, you know, I mean, an another form of going after them to is, you know, turnabout's fair play. If they're going to go after the producers and the channels that are running sci anti-Scientology stories talking about the abuses, why not go after DirecTV and point out, hey, here's yeah. all this information about these people. Why are you having this channel on your satellite system? Because DirecTV is nationwide. Do you know what I mean? It and is. It's, like, it's mostly, like putting, you know. Yeah, DirecTV is mostly on the coasts, and, uh, and then the other one, what's it called? Uh, the one with the kangaroo logo, the whatever it is, the hopper. No, whatever that no, is. Just, it's just kind of like, you know, people ask, what can they do? You know what I mean? Like, well, DirecTV, can you go to your, Congre can you go yeah, to your with, congressman and complain and all that? Yeah. Well, yeah, you can do that, and you can go to the IRS and complain, but another avenue might be go to Go to DirecTV saying, what the hell are you doing covering, you know, having this channel? On? Yeah, well, I think they'd have to go to the corporate owners of DirecTV. And that was AT&T yeah. when it was bought. They yeah. were, it was, it was AT&T. So I think they'd have to go to them. I mean, yeah, I don't know how well that stuff works. I mean, I know that. I don't either. It's just an idea. It's just Well, I, I mean, I'm back in my yeah. day, there was a woman yeah. by the name of Anita Bryant, who was one of these staunch right-wing Christians. And she was an actress and she represented. She did ads on TV for Florida orange, orange shoes. shoes. Yeah. Orange shoes, yeah. And, and so she was a, a, a part of what's called the moral majority. Right. And she pissed off so many people that they boycotted uh, Florida orange shoes and they fired her. So, you know, she got. Well, she got it's kind of like Bud Light. It's like the recent thing with Bud Light where they did that commercial and then all of a sudden people stopped drinking Bud Light almost instantly, you know, just. Yeah, you know, no, you that, can do that. That kind of cancel stuff is going on. I mean, on. but what do you. It's really weird with digital products because what are you going to do? You're going to be like, dear at and I'm canceling my my phone subscription. They're going to be like, OK, you know, yeah. we, we lose. You know, we don't care. I mean, those I think. They're very apolitical, like AT and T. Like I remember, the church was negotiating with with uh, the church. The enterprise called Scientology was negotiating with Directv for months, and they had a guy that was working there, who had been an employee. He had spearheaded Directv's digital launch, and so he really knew the inside workings. They were having all kinds of trouble negotiating money and da 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 da, which made no sense because Directv's got like a hundreds of empty TV stations. Just go look yeah. up where the religious stations are. And then uh, they got bought by AT&T overnight. It was approved. The entire board of AT&T said, no problem. Some wacky religion wants to pay us $10 million so they can have whatever is 236 or whatever the number is, which is off in the weeds on, on our set. Right. You can't even find it unless you're looking yeah, for it. Yeah. Who cares? Right. Yeah. And plus, nobody watches it but a bunch of Scientologists to settle their own emotions yeah. about being in a cult. Yeah. Like, literally, Love nobody was. Love it. Yeah, comments. and nobody uh, watches it on Direct TV. Would say we don't bother other religious channels. Why should we bother COS? Sadly, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you know, they would. Still. They would. Yeah, it's exactly, exactly. It would yeah. be something like that. But I think they should go down there and harass the people at SMP because that is the seat of power for all of Scientology management today. It is happening out of SMP. You know, it moves to Clearwater, but it's pinned to SMP. Because today, you know, Miscavige, when you were there, you remember the old management system that Hubbard set up. You know, you had you had Int Management, you had CMO Int, you had RTC, you know, the yeah. Watchdog Committee and all this kind of stuff. And that does not exist. No, a lot of people don't even remember what it was. And now he's, it's an oligarchy, you know, Miscavige yeah. is Putin. And then you've got these oligarchs. There's, you know, one running you know, uh, Bridge Publications, there's one running the Dissemination Center, which where they print all their bullshit that shows up in your mailbox. And there was uh, another one uh, at what's called Compilations, which looks like something out of the end of Indiana Jones. It's the biggest warehouse in the world, and they have everything <laughs> Hubbard ever did laid out yeah. on tables because Miscavige is so insane. He believes if he can just get everything laid out properly, he'll figure it all out, and the whole world will, will be his. He doesn't realize that everything Hubbard did is insane, so it's never going to work out. But each of the people running those things, those are the oligarchs of Scientology. And, and they're like a musical chairist because, you know, depending on which ones he threatens and, you know, uh, you know, sends away for temporarily or whatever. So I think they yeah. should be protesting at SMP. I think that would be the most effective. Well, I want to, we're getting here to the end and we're going to go to questions here, but I would okay, just want to mention in, in your book, and I'm not going to reveal this because there's, okay. there's, you know, this is the end of the book and right. it's very, very good. There's a cliffhanger here and I, I don't want to give it away, but something okay. happens at SMP, Scientology Media Productions, which then results in you eventually 
being, you know, distrusted and leaving, and I'm not going to go right. into detail. Right. But right. people right. should read your book to hear the story as to what happened and why. Yeah. And uh, it's it's quite quite uh, it's an, an interesting read, and I'm just going to leave it at that. But please read uh, Mitch's book. Um, and uh, you can get that full story there. But I wanted to also then ask you another thing too, and this, and then we'll go to questions, right? Okay. Which is okay. Obviously, you know, there's some another interesting story which we're not going to go into right now, which you mentioned about you know the filmmaker that uh, promoted the uh, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis and her connection to Hubbard, which is an interesting chapter. Lenny Riefenstahl. Yeah. And it's an interesting chapter and I'm not going to go into it now, but okay. my, my question is this, okay. Cause you call the book, um, uh, Scientology, the big lie, how I made an evil cult look good. Right. Yeah. Have you gotten, has, have you gotten any backlash from, you know, I mean, I mean, obviously you left and you're a skilled director and right. uh, you can do movies and TV and you can write scripts and things like that. Have you had difficulty getting work? I know there was COVID and I know there was a strike, but yeah. have you had difficulty because of your connection to Scientology? I don't know. I mean, yes, absolutely. Because I have no credits. I have nothing I can point to, uh, you know? I, I, so yeah, in that sense, in the sense that uh, in my, in the business of being a film director uh, or a filmmaker, you're going to rely on your credits and you're going to rely on an agent who sees value in you so that they can then sell you. And because of what, how I spent my career nobody sees any value in that maybe on kind of like on an individual basis, you know, I, I met with the producer of the aftermath. She knew my work because they'd studied for Scientology. She was very, very gracious in trying to help me get some work, but it didn't work out. So, um, yeah, I mean, I I haven't seen the boycott. If there's any kind of boycott kind of thing, I'm not aware of it. But definitely, for having gone in that direction with my career, it was definitely made it nearly impossible to get work. So, yeah, and then but I'm still working on it. No, and obviously our viewers know you've been an outspoken critic since you left, since you yeah. since you did your like your first or second interview with us, and then started right. your own channel, right. and then right. you all you had already started your book, writing it, and all that. Yeah. So you obviously have regrets, and you've stated them on channel and on interviews and stuff like that. And it's like anything, uh, you know, you know, we call our channel peeling the onion because it takes time. I mean, you're so into everyone's so into the cult mindset when you're in that you don't even consider what's going to happen when you get out. And it takes time to look yeah. back on what you did and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, how, how, how you can change things. And yeah. you're doing I mean, a good I, job of it. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. I mean, I, I wasn't restricted to a Seward property. I mean, for little pieces I was, but unlike a lot of people like you and others who were restricted and really very much uh, kept in a kind of a constant, not a concentration, but, but a kind of like ideological lockdown camp, right? Like a, uh, I didn't experience that, but I experienced like there's, okay, let's just, I'm, before we get to questions, let me just say this one thing. So yeah. uh, cultic abuse, especially in Scientology, it's kind of like a spectrum, right? But the one end of it, you have people with no privilege. And at the other end of it, you have people with a lot of privilege and, <laughs> It's just, it's, it, it's like when you have no privilege and you get thrown in the hole, you get fed rice and beans, you get punched in the face. Then when you have a lot of privilege, you get treated really well and you get isolated, but you still have this demand for your attention, your demand, your, your, your basic resources that you have, whatever you have to give as a human as is diverted into this other thing and you're tricked into it. So I was just at a different end of the spectrum of what abuse is than a lot of other people. But right. if you have no idea. I wrote about that in my book. I'm like, when you leave, you think the decision to leave is all that it's going to take. Then you're going to just move towards a brighter future. And then you're like, then you come face to face with reality. What the first thing you realize is how broken you are from having been involved in that activity. And I was an enabler. I mean, I wasn't an abuser. And, 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 sometimes being an enabler is worse. You know, I don't have nightmares. Everybody I know who worked at the base, Mark, Mike, other people, they've all told me that they had nightmares, at least for a while, that they were back at the base. I never had one nightmare. About two weeks ago, I had a dream. This is so funny that I was back at gold. I was working. Everything was great. Hi, Mitch. Hi, Mitch. How's it going? Blah, blah, blah. And I was had this welling up fear inside of me. Oh my God! I hope ethics doesn't find out about what I put on YouTube. 
<laughs> that was my nightmare. Now I have I have dreams from time to time, but I don't call them nightmares. But I do have yeah. dreams from time yeah. to time that I'm back at the base working yeah. for Miscavige, and I'm going like, "What am I doing back here? I don't know. I got a yeah, good life. exactly. I That's there, what you know? I was doing. I'm like, God, I hope they don't find out. I mean, you know, I think I was back in the mentality of I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills this month, so maybe I could do it. You know, with some stupid yeah, shit and, and like it that. takes time. Like I've been out 34 years. You know, yeah. you've been out what five, six years? 30, I mean, 34 been minutes. No, I not that yeah, long. No, I mean, so I, the, la the last time it, I was it, there it was in time. early 2020. So it's not that long. Yeah, yeah not that long. And then I continued hey. doing some small jobs for them during uh, during the pandemic. So you know, right. Anyway, I wanted to mention this is Mitch's book, Scientology: The Big Lie: How I Made. The, an evil cult look good. Yeah, uh, you can I order this book on Amazon. Okay. Hey, and, it, and, and it wasn't it wasn't just films, Mark. It wasn't just films, yeah. but the work we did on films is what inspired what the ideal works became in terms of how they look and how they're organized. So, right, it, it was a lot of stuff. Hey, can we blow through? That's right. I forgot questions? to ask you. I, yeah, we are going to yeah. do that now. But I I forgot about that. I, that's actually something I was going to ask you about. We'll yeah. do that at another time. But anyway, I just just a commercial for your book. Order Thank his you. book. You can get it in paperback. Uh, is it in hardback? Somebody asked. That. It is. It's no, absolutely. Hardback. It's in hardback. Oh, it is. Uh, you can get it in hardback. You can get it in uh, hardback from Amazon. They don't have dust covers at Amazon. And, and you can get, I think if you order, I, 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 hey, hi, Misha. How are you? Um, I think if you order it from uh, uh, Barnes and Noble, you get a nicer hardback copy they're more expensive to print i make less money but i don't care whatever you want to do but yeah there's a hardback if you go to my merch store and you order a hardback i'll sign it for you and ship it to you as long as you're in the united states yeah yeah it's really expensive to send these books over i did one yesterday i accidentally somebody ordered one from england and i did find out that you can ship usps slow boat for thirty-two dollars, so uh, yeah, no, it's more than the cost of the book. You know yeah, oh, yeah. I mean? it's yeah. A, yeah, it's very expensive. But anyway, yeah, order the book, order an autographed copy. It's it's well worth your time to read, and uh, I just wanted to mention that here, uh, you know, to to get uh, books. Anyway, we yeah, I appreciate it, Mark. Uh, and don't no, forget, don't don't forget to go to Amazon and leave me a re review. It helps. Okay. That's a good yeah. thing. And also, you know, subscribe to our channels, hit that like button, yeah. you know, write comments and all that, and we'll get to it. I've got to start a bunch of stuff here. I'll go ahead and just put up the the stuff here. Just bear with me. Sure, um, no problem. Let's see here. Uh, here we go. Okay, this is from Power Lies to Paralyze. Question, what do you two guys think are your common personality traits that DM preferred to have closest to him and that led you out of Scientology? I know. I know. Smarts. Smart. I was smarts just going to say smart. And skills. Yeah. Smarts and skills. Yeah, intelligence. You could do something and it was done. <laughs> you could do something right and you had a brain. So it's funny, Mark. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't suffer fools. And no. he, he doesn't like people who don't know what they're doing. And so if you show any kind of competence at something, yeah, then it's somebody that he that he likes because he can't do it himself. Well, yeah, if and you make him look good, Mark, you made him look good. You yeah. you put and so all did that you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. You put all that Sydney stuff together, you put those lines together, you were like it, it was coming out of his office, dude. That's all on him. Yeah. And then you get punched in the face for it. Nice. <laughs> exactly. Uh, next question here is okay from Ken Barlow. Is Mitch's book available in the UK? I need to put it with my collection of a first edition Dianetics, Bareface Messiah, and John A. Tax book. Well, thanks for that. It's absolutely available uh, in the UK. It's available in about 20 markets, maybe 25 markets. So there you go. Okay. Thanks very much. Next question is from an, an anti Harju. Uh, question, Mark and Mitch, did you know each other at all while still in your Scientology days, or have you met each other only after? After. I mean, yeah, I knew his name. Yeah, it was name. weird. Yeah. I knew his name, I, and when I was in, we hired a director, Mitch Brisker, you know what I mean? He yeah. did, did the music video, but I never saw him or met him back in those days, but I knew of him, and then, of course, um, yeah. you know, you reached out to me when we started our channel. I did. And, uh, and I, you did. I you reached out to me, yeah, and, and I we said, Mark, I want to meet we, you. 
because one of the we recorded an interview with you, even though your microphone wasn't very good. Oh my god, I was I didn't know what I was doing. It was one of our most popular videos. So thanks. Yeah, we should redo it because it was technically really bad. I think I just (laughs) want to say the viewers, I've said this before, I want to say it again. One of the reasons I reached out to you, you were the first like ex in base member that I reached out to. Mm -hmm. And and I wanted to meet you and do an interview. It's because I knew how much uh how much it would piss off David Miscavige because I had, <laughs> I had to sit there and look at your hate site and all this stuff. Oh you yeah. Know, I called Karen up. I apologize. I said, you don't know me. My name, blah, blah. She said, yeah, I know who you are. I said, I want to apologize for your hate site. She said, I didn't even know there was one, but you know, that's how we became friends. Cause I was kind of, I've never to... looked at mine. I've, I've never yeah, looked at mine. I know what's probably me. on it it's... because I've, I've been attacked, you know, through emails and other things. Yeah. It, yeah. So. But Mark, it's and, also, and I know you... it's, but I, I don't look at it because it's, I know the truth. And it's like, yeah, you, know, plus, you can take anything and twist it to make it look like something bad. And that's what they yeah. do. Plus, it's anyway. it's very badly written. I, I It's really poor. So you can tell it's that's from okay. people that aren't educated. So they're, yeah, right, let's move on here. Uh, again, from the same person, Mitch, how did you want to go ahead after OT3? Because to me, it just sounds all kind of crazy. Well, you're a Scientologist. I know for me, I, I just carried on. You know what I mean? Yeah. I Plus, you know, the thing is, I can give you, I'll try to give you a brief answer on that. Uh, I guess there's the sunk cost fallacy. You've spent a lot of time. You 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 take these little steps up to that point. And let's, let's face it, and I think you'll agree with this, human behavior is extremely mysterious. We don't always understand why people act the way they do. We don't understand why all of a sudden that person fell out of love with us. We don't understand why somebody else got the job and they didn't. We don't understand why a guy took a machine gun into a kindergarten. We don't, we don't understand these things. It's I don't care how skilled mental health workers may be or philosophers or whatever. Human behavior and human nature remains, by and large, a mystery. And OT3 offers a very plausible explanation. If you've been indoctrinated up to that point, all of a sudden you have an explanation for why people behave the way they do, and you go for it. It's not as nutty as it sounds because you're getting it all out of context. And I'm not defending it by saying it's less nutty than it is. I'm defending the context. Because when it's being ridiculed on uh, on South Park, yes, it's absolutely nutty. But when you're getting it within the context of being indoctrinated in that group, it makes a lot of sense. Well, and it's the same. And I and I'm not criticizing any other religions either. But there are fanciful and you know things that people who don't know the religion at all yeah. will go like, oh, that sounds that sounds crazy. That's yeah, something I mean, that must be yeah, fake. Uh, you know what I'm, I mean? And, but yeah, when I'm, you're indoctrinated and you're a believer, you go on, you go along with it, you know. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna part ways with you on not re- re- making fun of other religions. I don't have any back off on that. It's weird to me. It's like <laughs> we were from this cult and 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 we were indoctrinated and we believe in all this crazy shit. But like I, I'm not trying to put the Mormons down just because they think you actually have three bodies and you're gonna end up with your own planet and the, all this stuff that's at least as crazy as Scientology. So yeah, they have their own issues too. So uh, yeah, right, but good, good point, Mark. Yeah, they, like there was a bunch of other ones. Uh, Ken Barlow, Jesus, Catholics are going in and eating the body of Christ. People are okay with that. So Ken Barlow, do Scientology still release music albums? I don't know. No, I, not that I'm aware of. No, the gold musicians that you worked with, Mark, all they do is yeah. they do work on films. They don't do any right. recording, or and then the, they have a bunch. They have musicians now at. Scientology Media Productions who perform at events, but they don't record albums. They're, they missed out on that. I mean, Christian rock's huge, but Scientology rock wouldn't go anywhere. No. Okay, next question. Uh, again, from N.T. Uh, Harju. Uh, do you think that Scientology resonates more with people of sociopathic qualities, or does Scientology make people more sociopathic? Well, I can tell you the vast majority of people that are recruited into Scientology, like me, were in a very vulnerable state. And their empathy and their vulnerability was weaponized. Uh, Scientology, it weaponizes and exploits people's idealism, not their sociopathy. So if anything, it's going to move people in that direction as a survival mechanism. They're going to start reflecting the thing that is causing them so much hurt and pain. 
you know, look at Dave and Tom Cruise. I mean, that's a whole nother discussion, but you have one guy, one narcissist on one side who's reflecting a super celebrity. So he becomes a super celebrity. You got another super celebrity on the other side reflecting an evil cult leader. And so he becomes an evil cult leader. It's just, it's the way people mirror one another. And so most people get into Scientology do it for idealistic reasons. You know, I exactly. love to, I love to quote Mark Vincente who said, nobody gets in, nobody thinks they're joining a cult. They think they're joining something good. And then they find out they got fucked over. No, no, that's exactly right. I mean, I was 14, 13, 14. My dad got in and I got in and I got, I got help right away with my first auditing that I ever got. And then I was hooked and then, oh, we're trying to save the world. And, oh, we've got the answers. And I was idealistic enough to go like, that's what I want to do, you know. Okay, next question here is from Ken Barlow. I have a question that's always bugged me. But why do Scientology love blue buildings? <laughs> I think because they got a massive donation of blue paint and they're cheap. No, actually, uh, I, what I, I recall Hubbard wrote something. Yeah, but, yeah. There, Albert wrote an advice when they bought the Cedar Sinai Hospital. He wanted it not to look like a hospital and to paint it bright blue or bright colors so it stand out and also put that. Yeah, big well, you know, sign you can also rub shit. So all you over can your see reason. it from the freeway. Yeah, exactly. No, I know, but you know how you drive down the freeway yeah, yeah. and you can see it. He wanted it so people could see it. Well, they had a they had an architect who advised them to make it an earth tone blue. So it's not as hideous and that, yeah. that helped, but it's still ridiculous. The whole thing. Miss sunrise dawn. Thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, thank you for this interview, Mark, Mitch and Mark loving all the information. Well, thank you yeah, for watching. Yeah, for, really if you have any further questions, you could email me at, uh, at Scientology, the big lie at gmail.com. I'll, I'll, tr I'll always try to get to viewers questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a comment, and it also is a question too. Mitch, say something nice about uh, David Miscavige. Can you find something nice to say? He can't be all evil, or people wouldn't follow him. I guess. Well, thank you, uh, Andy Harju. Yeah, go ahead. You can take that question. Well, no, I was going to say. Well, he's not the reason that people got involved in Scientology. It's all no, Hubbard he's not. And the stuff that he did. Yeah, uh, but if you it was know, David Mark, Miscavige, you... you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be involved. But I will say this: the nice thing I can say about him. He does get things done, but he does it through fear. He does it through fear and strength. He does not get it through being nice to people and all that. Yeah. He, can, he can demand and get things done, just like they can demand and get a building, a train, you know, running on time. It's, you know, he's just. Yeah, I mean, that exactly. Way. I was going to actually use that analogy. Like, it was like, you know, uh, Mussolini got the trains to run on time. I mean, Miscavige is, he's a very good tactician. Um, he's yeah. very good at convincing people that he works harder than he does. And if you're making him look good and you're in that inner circle, he can be very generous with parishioners money in terms of, uh, love bombing you and giving you gifts. And he has a way as all really good sociopaths and narcissists do of coming across, uh, with f fake empathy and, and, and generosity and charm. Because if you were just all one thing, you, you wouldn't be a success. But that, when I first came on YouTube, I was trying to ex explain to people, no, this guy's more dangerous than you think. Because he can actually fool you into thinking that he's sympathetic and charming and generous. And people are like, eh, Mitch Brisker works for the church. <laughs> so it was just like, <laughs> I should Well, and you just reminded me of something else, too. The attorneys that work for Scientology, yeah. they, get, they get hooked by the money. And oh my once God. They're by, but once they're hooked yeah. by the money, Miscavige will yell at them and curse them out if it's some if they're doing something that he doesn't oh, agree yeah. with. Oh, yeah. He runs the he, attorneys. He, he'll he's rip like, their faces oh, off. Yeah. And they're afraid of losing that cash cow. Okay? Yeah. Have you ever and seen a, do what he says? Yeah. Monique Muffins Yingling, yes. who I got to know pretty well when I was I met her. I met her when she was first hired, you know. Yeah. You ever see her beach house? Uh, you ever see her beach house in the East Coast? I saw a photograph of it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That the woman had, she, whatever, she's really filthy nice. rich off of Scientology. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Next. Uh, this is a question. This has been asked before, but Cece, did you film the Marty hate videos? No, I didn't. I actually didn't. Uh, I almost did. I was actually in the room at Scientology Media Productions when Miscavige walked in and there was a few of us, um, I could remember if I took the time, but I'm not going to. There was a few of us in the room. We were in the broadcast building conference room. Miscavige walked in with his girlfriend, Lou, and just, you know, when he walks in the room, everybody looks at him because they're like, what, you know, what the hell is he going to want? And he, he just looked at us and he said, Marty's back. That was it. He said, Marty's back. And I knew when he said that, that he didn't mean back in Scientology. He mean back on our side. 
So he said, we're going to shoot some interviews. Mitch, I want you to do the camera planning. So I did a whole boatload of camera planning, including hiring an outside crew because he didn't want Seward members to do it. And, uh, but then I got busted. I got sent back to gold. So I didn't do it, but they executed the camera planning. They were essentially done somewhere near where Marty lives. They were probably done. I'm pretty sure by a, an OT8 Scientologist who I brought up there to work with me, kind of a, not a very talented, I, I shouldn't talk bad about it, but he's anyway, a guy named Randy Steph who does a lot of the hate sites. And, you know, he thinks he's doing the right thing because he's OT8. So he thinks that's a cool thing to do. I think he went off and did it with, uh, with a, with a crew, but yeah, no, I didn't do them. Um, I'm kind of glad I didn't do them because I hated Marty so much. I might have, yeah. I've never physically attacked anybody in my life, but I think I might have literally physically attacked Marty because he's such a horrible person. Yeah, he is. Uh, here's the next, another question. Uh, question OBG Foster Could uh, Scientology make money renting those facilities to people who make real films? No, because they're tax exempt and they would it would be a real problem. They'd have to set up a whole separate corporation that I, maybe there's a way to do it, but I, you know, sometimes I think I, you know, I hope, I hope they all go, it goes away and they have to sell that place. Cause whoever takes it over, I'm going to try to get a job there because or work there because it's a great place to work. Physically. It's a great place to work. It's the most toxic environment I've ever been in worse than gold. It's horrific. Okay. So, you know, yeah. Mark, we, I don't know if you, we have a couple of questions about the protests in LA and I wouldn't mind commenting on them. But yeah, I was going to say I, that I don't, I, Yeah, okay, go right good. ahead. Uh, go right ahead. Uh, answer well, away. They want to know, what do you think about the protest well, you got to put LA the question up. About the Mike and Marty. Hold on, they're at the very top. One second here. Uh, here we go. Mish. Okay, the Is person who wants, could you put up the one from, from Elizabeth about the the audio book from 1006? Let's just get that. No, I can do that, that, though, right here. Yeah, listen, Elizabeth. Anyway, thanks for the pressure. I'm working on it as fast as I can. I was hoping to get it done by the end of February. It's not looking good, but it's definitely moving along. And uh, I'll make a big announcement on YouTube and other places so you'll know. Okay, good. So let's go next. Uh, Michael Wincoop says, let's do that one. Well, here, I'll do this. What? This is his first question. Comments on attacks on uh -huh. Aaron and yeah, Squirrel that's the one I meant. Squad. Uh, yeah, so. And then here, here's a more detailed one here. Question, any comments on attacks in L.A. on Aaron and members of the First Amendment Squirrel Squad, auditors and protesters supposedly by OSA and actions of the LAPD? Well, everybody's going to think anything bad is OSA, and quite possibly it is. If they beat that kid up, uh, Chris, a uh, confident Chris, that they were responsible for that attack, which I'm not I'm not saying they were or they weren't, but at, at this point, it's, it's like they do have the resources to do that. To hire a PA, to hire a PA, to hire a PA, to find a thug, to go down there and, and attack that kid. They absolutely do. If that's the case, they are becoming so desperate. I mean, Miscavige must be so cranked about this because they're not like me and Mark. They're not like ex-apostates that are like just, you know, pissed off or whatever. This is public opinion, you know. I mean, these kids, when they showed up and I went down there and I met a bunch of them uh, and they're lovely kids they don't necessarily care about us they don't need us ex-scientologists uh, uh you know um i think what they're doing is perfect some other former scientologists have said no 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 protests never work that's not true they they in the, it, the number of people like the number of people that they turn away from scientology is significant and that's important it's it, you know if you stop the flow in that's more than enough. What I think they're doing is great. I love the fact that they're not wearing masks, that they're holding up phones, that they've discovered the power of personal. Like Miscavige spends a hundred million dollars on Scientology media productions, and then a kid goes out and spends five hundred dollars on a phone, and guess who wins? Okay, <laughs> the kid with the five hundred dollars has a bigger voice than David Miscavige Absolutely. does, and a bigger view, a bigger audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, that's what I think it is. I think um, I'd like to see the ex-Scientology community, the SPTV community, whatever, just kind of stay out of their way, right, and just really let them do that and support them. I suggested to Chris Without a Hellcat, hey, if you guys want to go down to SMP, I'll go down there with you. I'll tell you, you know, I'll feed you shit, stuff you can say, but I'm not like. You know, hey, wait, we've been doing this for years. You 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 have to be part of our group. They're their own thing. And I I think what they're doing is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, I'm 
literally I came up during the Vietnam war. We used to do sit-ins. We used to, you know, ditch school and do walkouts and all this stuff. And now I see this younger generation and they're, they're very focused on wanting to point their, their phones at something interesting because they want, you know, they want to be successful YouTubers, but they really are looking to do it at something significant. They're looking to, to point it at the, the, the fissures in, in the culture that it should be pointed at. They've discovered Scientology. They know nothing about Scientology except that it's bad. And that's all they need to know. So I, I love those kids. They have my 100% support. And it's like Bob Dylan said, you know, if you can't lend a hand, get out of the way because the times they are changing. So I think the best yeah, thing a lot I, of us can, can do is get out of their way. And I agree with you, Mitch. I, you know, I, I, I think it's fantastic what they're doing. It's just kind of like a <clears throat> organic thing that just sort of started with the one gentleman or whatever. And then all these other people. Yeah. Yeah. Because they pissed him off. Um, they messed with him. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then Janice, Janice was just in Clearwater a week and a half ago and she right. went down there. And she was with a couple of the uh, people that were doing the audits, uh, Laura, uh, Laura plays and uh, right. Sarasota Jerry and all that. Right. And, um, you know, it, we support that. You know what I mean? It's yeah. hundred percent. I, I, I think our role thing. is important. That doesn't supplant our role. It's like, they're on a different plank. They're on this other plank and well, they're very good well, at it. Yeah. And I just want to say, just because we don't do videos doing that sort of thing, that's not what our channel is about at our channel. Our channel is we're telling stories of people and the abuses that happened to them and the history of yeah. Scientology so that it's out there. That's what our channel is, and that's well, what it's I, about. I did go down there. I, I, I did. More power. Huh? Yeah. I did go down no, there. No, I was going to say more power to all the people. Yeah, I support yeah. them wholeheartedly. But yeah. but, I, but what we're doing is we're keeping our heads straight in terms of what we're doing because we want to get these stories out there. There's some of the people we're interviewing um, are very old or they're not going to be around much longer. I beg your pardon. Information. You couldn't be I, talking I, I, about me. No, not you, but I'm just saying. <laughs> but we want to get the information out there because you know what? It'll be gone. It'll be there forever. You know, Hubbard stuff could yeah. be stored under a vault, you know, a rock uh, yeah. mountain somewhere. Yeah. And, you know, maybe somebody will find it someday. But stuff that's on the Internet and in the cyber universe, it's going to be there forever because yeah, it's long time. always, always everywhere. So yeah. that's why we do that. But we do support the people that do that. As far as the arrest of Aaron, that was horrendous. And as also it's the same thing with, you know, the letters and stuff that got sent to the, you know, from the Aftermath Foundation. Look, they're friends of mine. I don't have anything to do with the Aftermath Foundation. Aaron is a friend of ours and all that. But the fact of the matter is, is that that was horrendous. That was kind of like, you know, really the, the way that that was phrased and attacking the people. That, that shouldn't have been done. That's kind of like, yeah, I think I told you we yeah. would call it a one, one comment. It was covert hostility. That's not the way you treat people. And I don't agree with that whatsoever, but yeah. um, you know, I, we're, we're, it's not our deal. We're not, we're not involved in that whole situation. And I hope that for everybody's sake, that Aaron and Mike and Mark and Claire and the people involved with all of that, that they get it sorted out. Yeah. I mean, if I could just add my own comment, because you sure. know, I, I've no, you know, it's like I'm Mike and Mark and Claire were like, um, I mean, I've known them since as long as they when they were at the gold base and blah blah blah. I could go on, go on forever. I know Mike since 1990. I think that what has been happening is people are losing sight of the fact that we all need to stand on common ground, and that there's a lot of people who had a lot of trauma. Mike, Miriam, everybody, all of us have had a lot of trauma. The thing is all of the people that are having this conversation, we stopped doing the damage that we were doing. So I don't know why we're finding ways of re-traumatizing one another. I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to be like, you know, the Pollyanna and not be looking at the reality of the things, but we're losing, as I said, we're losing sight of common ground and we all need to, st uh, we all need to be standing on common ground and be supporting one another. And, and, and there's like, there's just some things that are happening where there's, we're we're finding that all of a sudden the 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 you know the second gens are like a breakaway republic. They're like Chechnya and like they're their own thing, and that the old guys like you and I are responsible for the trauma, and we're the ones that have made it all happen. And that you know you have people that were on that were public, that were on staff, that were in the Sea Org, and all of a sudden they're becoming like contingents, and we're losing the 
the commonality of why we're all here and what we're fighting against. You know, while the kids in LA, the TikTok army, whatever you want to call them, while they're doing their thing, my consider my role is that I don't just care about people who were abused by Scientology, that I would like to think that I am here representing people who were put through trauma. I don't care where it came from, a cult, a relationship, whatever group, I don't care. And that's kind of our role because the TikTok kids, they're not really doing that. They're trying to bring down an evil empire. So that's kind of my, my thought on the whole current situation. Well, and, and, and we say the same thing. It's like, we got to keep our eye on the ball. You know what I mean? The, yeah. The ball, in my my opinion, the ball is Miscavige and Scientology. Yeah, and 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 because of these the these little fissures, all, all these little working fissures. towards it. Yeah, well, all these you know, little I, I fissures. Just, Mitch, Mitch, what I was going to say. Is, yeah. Miscavige is like the Dutch boy trying to put his finger in the dike where the leaks are happening. And yeah, but he's also so laughing, fast. Mark. He's laughing at us Bro. because of all of these fissures that are happening in the ex Scientology community, and he's. He's like you hear about this whole thing about Osa and Mike and and these abuse abuses that he he uh, covered up. And I got to tell you, I've been in the room when he's addressing Osa, right? N not ever when Mike was there, but I've been in there when he was ripping these people some new buttholes. And I got to tell you, he's getting off lucky on all this stuff because people are like, "Well, it must have been Mike who designed that." And, and that's not true. Those guys are screamed at by Miscavige. He comes up with all that shit. Somebody needs to leave the country. He's like, you mf or you get them out of the country. You do this, you do that. It is 100% under his guidance. And all these other guys are just running for cover, trying to survive. They don't want to lose their families. They don't know what to do. So it's it, it, it's he's getting off way too lucky. No, no, way too easy. I, I, I want to finish my point, which is sure, I'm sorry. The, Mark, he's I like just... the Dutch boy trying to stop the breaks in the dike. Right. And they're overflowing. He can't, right. doesn't have enough fingers. Okay. Uh, the, the protests out in front of the, the test center, right. the audits and all that, that's one attack. Our channel right. telling stories, the stories you tell, the stories we tell, right. the stories the SPTV tells. That's another major thing. I mean, he nothing's been done yeah. to stop or refute any of this stuff. The oh, lawsuits yeah, that's not, that I, be, I, the law, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. The lawsuits that are going on with Leah yeah. Remini and the victims and all that. Yeah. So all of this adds up to big headaches for him. And we just need to keep our eye on the ball and just keep working together towards yeah, the same. Yeah, exactly. Because, and, and, and get off because all of these fissures that start to appear, they are help Osa. I mean, that's their fan in the flames. Like they're making these. You mean the fissures in there? You mean the fissures between in the, the community, the, the, the SP, the community. Yeah. Uh, no, I agree. Cause that's yeah, what they try to do. That's just want to run Hubbard strategy. That's yeah, but I, ju strategy. I just want to say unquestionably people in this community have made mistakes They've made, mm -hmm. they've given statements that were they shouldn't have given, and they've handled things wrong, and blah blah blah. But again, we can't lose track. We can't lose sight of the common ground that we need to be standing Correct. on in order to end this kind of abuse across yes. all, all, you know, across what, whatever it is, and whatever part of the club you are in, third generation, second generation, first generation, born in, up born in, blah 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 blah. Like, can we just get to a point where there's no clubs and no status and no, my trauma is worse than your trauma. And well, you don't have any right. perspective because you never ate in the packed dining room with the snob, with the schlubs and all that kind of crazy bullshit. <laughs> and we can all just stand on common ground against this right. one enemy. And I'm going to get off my soapbox now. Thank you, Mark. No, no, that's great. I, I agree with you. And it, I think I think our viewers agree, too. I'm seeing in the comments. Yeah, I'm probably going to get canceled now because I didn't pick sides. Everybody wants you to pick sides, but. Yeah. Well, there's no sides really to pick. The side no, is there are damage, ultimately there are no sides. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Okay. Uh that's all the questions that I saw. Do you see any others? Uh Mr. Um, no, uh I thought the uh I don't understand the Ken Barlow said something at Mitch. I thought that if did you see this one? I thought that if a Scientologist does a project and it fails. Then that Scientologist is liable. Do you see that one? It's it's back at uh it's real it's a one thirty. Yeah, I know what you're talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah. I wasn't sure if that was a question or a comment or what, but uh let me see. Well it was that it was a comment here, it's right here. 
It's right here. Yeah, I mean, this is, so Ken Barlow says that, Mitch, I thought that if a Scientologist does a project and it fails, then that Scientologist is liable. So wouldn't Dave be liable for a $100 million failure? Or do the rules not apply to him? No, they don't apply to him. He doesn't even consider himself a Sea Org member. I mean, I remember once I got thrown into a, sh a shoot one day with no preparation. It was like, you need to go in the studio now and do that. And I'm like, but I haven't seen sets. I haven't approved anything. No, you just need to go in and do it. After I got sent back up there, after I was at SMP. And it didn't go well. We had to reshoot it. And I got a court of ethics. And they made me pay $2,000 to cover the cost of the sets. And it was the most unfair thing in the world. But this, that's never going to happen to Miscavige. He's never, nobody's ever, he has no liability. It's so, yeah, absolutely. The, the, uh, the rules do not apply to him. And plus, no Scientologist thinks they should. Because they believe he's the guy making it all happen and saving the universe. That's right. So okay, there you go. I just want to, I want to thank you, Mitch, for coming on and talking about your book. We'll do some more videos in the future. Oh, I'm yeah, sure. please, Mark. I, I, I love your perspective. I love coming on with you. Uh, no, we have common common reality on a lot yeah, of things. Yeah, for sure. But anyway, um, but anyway, I want to say please subscribe to our channel. Please subscribe to Mitch's channel. We'd appreciate it. If you have any questions that we missed, please ask in the comment section. I check them all the time, and I will answer them. Uh, if you feel like donating to my channel, uh, you can buy us a coffee uh, just down in the video link down below. Just click on that, and uh, any donation is appreciated. We're not getting rich off of this stuff. It goes into back into the channel. And uh, so anyway, we appreciate, though, any, any of your sure. support. It's still helpful. And then, of course, uh, you need to uh, buy Mitch's book at amazon.com at his website two copies two copies copy. give one away as a gift i got two i got yeah. two and uh, when the audiobook comes out i'll get that too because i'll listen great. to it uh, you know great uh, great but it's a great book and i really appreciate you mitch coming on here because i think it's an important book i think people should read it i think you'll find it's an enjoyable read um and uh you know i just wanted to say to everybody i hope you enjoyed everything yeah <laughs> thanks mark i really appreciate it you're too kind and uh, as soon as I'm done with the audio book, I'm starting out another book. It's a novel. And uh, so hopefully I'll get as good a feedback from that as well. So Fantastic. Well, for everybody, we want to thank you for watching. And until the next sure. time, bye-bye. Uh, thank you.